Hello everyone, can you hear us? Good good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're at. Uh, welcome to another Digital Foundry live stream. Uh, I'm John, of course. At the top there, we have the venerable PC98 Audi. Good to see you again, my man. Of course. And sandwiched between us on the, uh, the stream layout here is the legendary Chris Holzbeck, who's joining us all the way from the desert in his uh, mobile home. Not Chris, the German desert, though. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> it's I'm good from to... Arizona. <laughs> it's good to have you here broadcasting from the desert, no less. This is crazy. On solar power. <laughs> wow. So wow, so this is really science this is, this fiction incredible. at this point. So totally. yeah, I love it. You're going all the way. But uh, so yeah, we're here today to talk about and play some Turrican. We've got four Turrican games. I'm playing Turrican Flashback here on the Nintendo Switch. Um, I think just when released. Is, this is just out today, right? Or yeah, today it was released digitally okay, cool. for uh, worldwide. All right. Awesome. Can you guys? Hopefully, you guys can hear the uh, the music there. I have the the audio kind of at a reasonable volume, so I think yeah, Chris should, worked on the uh, music here, right? Yeah, we should mention that before we even go into the game, because this uh, main menu music here is brand new, isn't it, Chris? Yes, I composed that for the collection, and uh, that was kind of something. So we should. Before even starting playing any of this, we should note that I was the producer on this game. And of course, I think Chris has some involvement with the Turrican series at some point. And <laughs> John uh, helped play test, and we're working on that documentary. So this isn't oh, yeah. a review. No. Uh, we Since we're both working on the game, so this is just to enjoy the game and enjoy some of the uh, fruits of our labor. But uh, yeah, the main menu music was kind of, uh, I came to Chris and just kind of felt like we needed something there because originally it just had the Final Fight original tune. And That's I kind right. of felt like the main menu needed to be a little bit slower, more nostalgic, you know, not so in your face right away. We need to kind of be eased into the Turk and rather than balls to the wall right away. So yeah, exactly. It, it was a little bit like um, what you would do on consoles for a menu, so something that's a little bit more subdued. Yeah. But I think uh, the 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 Tarakan vibe is still in there. Oh, totally. I mean, you nailed it, and I mean, obviously okay. you would, because uh, you. yes, you're the <laughs> maestro. I but, had a lot uh, of fun making that. Yeah, I mean, now that you're a little bit older and such, I think you kind of. I worked with you, of course, for many years. Uh, you and I worked on several games together. And many projects and i kind of feel like your strongest works these days are a little bit more like melancholic and slower so i think maybe that's something that yeah. comes with age maybe it kind of fits it works here yeah definitely i mean with the uh, I, you remember that uh, rise of the machine right where i did oh, uh, yeah. original amiga music again as a bonus uh, for our orchestral recording mm -hmm. uh that you know was more like the old days you know going going out for for in-game music that's like fast paced and stuff like that but um yeah like for for something like this menu i mean you have to scale it back a little bit and yeah make it more um more ambient sounding i have to say that john looks distractingly handsome with his new camera i'm just noting this because your camera looks great john Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm using a. I switched to a Panasonic a GH4. So I have a GH5 for my main camera. Now I'm using an actual GH4 up here. So not the not the scoff at Chris. I mean, it looks gorgeous as usual as well. well yeah, this is a great look. Uh -huh. Chris, since you're the special guest though, which Turrican game should we start with? One, two, Mega Turrican or Super Turrican? Which which one, one do you want to talk course. about the most? Start with one. Start with one. Start with one, and then maybe play a little bit of two. I have about an hour, so... Alright, alright. Let's see so, what we can fit in. Another thing about the main menu, we can just start the game, but as you noticed, there are descriptions for each game. Oh yeah. Uh, I wrote those because I actually sought out some people at Factor 5 and was like, what's the actual story of these games? And we had to scramble <laughs> to find some documents that kind of detailed some sort of vague story. And then I wrote uh, some original fiction, just kind of flesh it out a bit. But those uh, descriptions were fun to uh, write. And they also note what's exclusive to each game. So uh, right. I, will, I will also keep track of all the Super Chats. So if you have questions for Chris or anyone, really, uh, John as well, then just uh, keep sending them in. And I'll try to note as many questions as I can for Chris, of course. But we had one already that says, 
Uh, Sharky, will DF do any videos about the Dragon Engine Yakuza games on PC? Uh, possibly so, because I love those games, and Alex, I think, is also into them, so sure. If they use that engine on the new Turrican game, then we will we'll for sure talk about it. So one of the, before we get too deep into this here, one of the, one of the coolest things about this collection, if you bring open the options here, you know, a lot of these games collections have uh, video options, right? but this one, oh boy. So you flick on the CRT option and you, you immediately get this, you know, filter, but as you can see, it's fully adjustable. And I think, Audi, you were kind of responsible for getting this implemented somewhat. Uh, it's not responsible in the sense that uh, we should note that the developer of this game is Rattalaika Games, uh, led yes. by Steven Snake, a legend in emulation. And uh, they had this idea to just kind of get a better, you know, none of us are really fans of these fake scan lines. Right. And so, and uh, I have a lot of extensive uh, experience with RetroArch, so I was kind of like, hey, you know, should get a good shader in there if the consoles can handle it. And uh, thanks to their technical wizardry, it can, and it looks amazing. And you can custom make uh, your own look, so you can have curvature, yeah. you can have all this stuff. So they seem um, to have different masks as well, depending on how you want the phosphor grid to look. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. I won't use it for the stream because it looks bad in video. Yes, but, but it looks amazing looks on awesome your uh, in person. HD. It exactly. really looks. It's not just you know scan line filters are generally just you know dark lines and Whoop. some uh, blurring, but uh, or darkening of the screen. But this is a proper shader. It's literally a filter on top. So, so. why I guess why we have Chris here, of course, we should probably talk about some of. So this is obviously the this is the game I'm actually least familiar with, Turrican One, uh, but this is kind of you know it already sounded pretty amazing at the time, and I think this is where you didn't do the full seven channel TFMX stuff for Turrican One yet. That was with two, right? Right. This was just like probably the the the, the biggest game at the time on the Amiga for us and uh, uh, I just you know made the most out of the four voices and um, <clears throat> of course since you have uh, sound effects going on really the compositions are all for three voices Oof. And that, you, I mean that's that's really interesting to think about from like a modern perspective of trying to create such good music when you really only have access to three voices to produce that sound uh, that's that's tough. Oh, that's a cool effect, yeah, by the way. Yeah, you really have to concentrate on the uh, main elements, you know, particular melody and, and, and drum and bass and the chords, and that's it, basically. Usually I would play the, um, the drums and the bass sounds on one channel, and the, the way I could do that is not by mixing, but um, basically uh, it was like quick succession of samples. So like a very very short bass drum a kick drum and then uh, immediately followed by the bass tone you would almost perceive it as two voices playing at the same time but they were really like uh, just one after another That's super and cool. um, was a little bit of clever arranging the uh, snare drums and, and, and things like that then you could you could do already like quite convincing drums and bass on one channel and then the second channel would be like chords or some arpeggios or something and then the third one would be the melody and then uh, sometimes i did use the fourth channel for like echo effects but they would be then suppressed when you would uh, have a lot of sound effects but then when you're maybe like just walking around and then uh, in, a, in, in a dungeon and there's no enemies and you're not shooting, then you would hear the the echo effect of oh, yeah. one of the melody voices or something like that. Yeah. So John, when you die, it's a good time to show off one of the new features in this collection. If you push uh, the right shoulder button, you can actually rewind the game and go backwards and correct oh. your mistakes. Well, we're going to have to <laughs> test that out then. <laughs> <laughs> oh cool, I didn't know about that feature. 
Yes, so uh, Turrican is probably one of the games where you kind of need a rewind feature just because uh, death lurks on every corner. Yeah, yeah so. this, one, this one's tough. And Shoot or die. <laughs> also, it's an interesting. So uh, I think one of the things we were thinking about about this collection initially was like, hey, these games are designed to run at uh, 50 hertz, right? Yeah, yes. Oh, that's yeah. And... You know, obviously, it was looked into trying to, to do 60 hertz conversions, but just due to the way that the game works, uh, the way the source code is written, and I don't even think they had access to the source code, but from yeah. what I can understand, this game is so hard-coded to run at 50 hertz that just it, it just wouldn't work. Yeah, so I can talk a little bit more about that, because, yeah, absolutely, I mean, these are 50 hertz games, and the thing is that the new consoles cannot output 50 hertz, really. No. And so that's not an option. And uh, basically then we either have to kind of come up with some trickery just to minimize it. You cannot get rid of it, the stuttering. But uh, we looked into doing a 60 hertz version either via finding some lost 60 hertz version from like an American release, which doesn't exist. Well, it's, or, it turns out that it's Hurricane, well, Turrican 2 at least, did get it like an American MS-DOS release. It did get. Yes, and the that also runs at 50 hertz. So that runs at 50 hertz, and it doesn't run on the original source. So it's a different yeah. game, technically, from a Danish team. That's right, um, yeah. So we couldn't uh, touch that, even if we wanted to. And so basically, uh, we tried to do some hackery with the emulation, where we output it at 60. Uh, the problem then was that, one, the music did not play proper, which was oh, yeah. unacceptable for a Turrican game. Of course. Uh, and I don't think Chris would have liked the, the music to be off-tempo. And then the oh, other man, part the was... Is amazing. <laughs> it really is. So, And the other problem was that some of the call-ups uh, in the code didn't work because of this new um, timing. So some bosses wouldn't show up or like other crashes would happen. Yeah, like so timing just, stuff. Yeah, so we just had to basically do our best to minimize the stuttering <laughs> as best as possible. So, but I think uh, for most part, it's pretty good. Uh, I don't mind so much. Uh, I mean, no, it's you know, it works. It it works well enough, I think. If you look for it, you'll see it. Of course, you'll see it. Oh, that's but, uh, yeah, it that's usually how well. it goes. But yeah, I, I think it's and. And I think you ca you can play it in uh, can't you play it in 50 on modern screens? No, because anyway. the game consoles themselves don't actually support 50 hertz output. No. Oh, okay. No. Yeah. So you so could. So we have do a it. super chat question from the Ozone Nightmare. Oh. Uh, ain't that the truth? Uh, question for you all: uh, What game series would you like to see get this type of flashback treatment? Haha, <laughs> I have one. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Chris. Please. A Pedia, please. <laughs> oh, yes. yes. A Pedia. Will we get the Pedia 1 on that collection? I think uh, that was only... Hopefully. Uh, <laughs> that was only released in Japan, right? On Laserdisc. Yeah, oh, on yeah. Laserdisc. On Laserdisc. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, man. Yeah, yeah Pedia has like, incredible music, too. Wow. Yeah, it's just amazing work uh, on that. I'm not sure who did that music. <laughs> Um, flashback treatment. Hmm. Well, I, I've always thought that I would like to see, I mean, unre unrelated to any of this, but I'd like to see Sparks to return. Yeah, okay, well, I mean, that's a different subject altogether, but, uh, but like, Sparks you know, a collection. Yes, that's what I mean. I mean but, uh, without the 3D game, please. I'd say I would oh, want yeah. the Assault Suit series. Assault Ooh, Suit Plain Oz, Vulcan. That would be a nice one. Uh, Last Ninja uh, is also another one that I think could uh, benefit some sort of treatment. Because Last Ninja is hard to play and probably needs some quality of life uh, fixes and whatnot like this. So, but uh, I'm happy to see that the Amiga is finally kind of coming back and now playable on console like this. Because that was one of the challenges when we started this production was the fact that no one had really done Amiga in these compilations. I wouldn't can't just take existing emulation software and put it on a disc or a okay, game card in this case. So way. everything had to be done from scratch. And uh, yeah, Radalaika did an amazing job. They really 
Yeah, they and did. Of course, they had people like uh, they had Lutz Ostokoan there to help out, and they had, of course, Chris checking out the music, making sure that that was, you know, as good as it should be, because. That's kind of the thing about the Turrican series, is that you really cannot screw up the music. You can't have a single note off, because people will notice. Yeah, so, that would that would be a shame. And then think... and sound emulation is one of the hardest things to nail, especially with some of the... the this collection has three different systems. It has Mega Drive, which is kind of hard to get uh, right. Oh, yeah. Uh, which uh, John knows all about from doing, like, analog stuff and whatnot. And then the Amiga, which hadn't really... A console been done yet? Oh, I see. And modern vintage gamer says he wants an X out Z out collection. Oh, okay, yeah, that might be an option. Um, so I, I get a lot of. Uh, uh, somebody said, "Hey, Chris, I love you, man. Thanks." Um, <laughs> there's uh, there's some fans in the chat there. Oh, I would That's, hope so. There should be. I hope so. Yeah. I see also Lutz is in the chat, so I oh, give Lutz him a salute. Uh, he worked uh, very hard on yeah, the American back in the day and uh, brilliant oh. he guy. Said, he said Apedia is not a series. Has he not heard of Apedia 1? <laughs> yeah, that's true. On Laserdisc, exclusively <laughs> on in Laserdisc. Japan. I, I wish Lutz would w like to have that. Oh, the collector like Lutz? Uh huh. No doubt. So Oof, yeah, this, still... this, is, this, this, this game's pretty tough. It keeps you on your toes. Also, uh, there, there was actually another game that was kind of like a successor to Apedia, or at least like continuation of that kind of theme, which was called Miss Honeybee. Oh, yes, oh. which didn't release, did it? It wasn't released, but uh, who knows? Maybe. Uh, a, Kaiko, maybe could, uh, a Kaiko collection would be fun. I mean. Uh... Yeah, right. The Kaiko guys were cool. Donald Matsuke, Chris Holzbeck, and Peter. And you're all around still, so why not? Yeah, that, that rewind, unfortunately, doesn't work when when your power is really low. I <laughs> well, think you can yeah, rewind was... pretty far, so yeah, just keep true. holding it in. Uh, I, I forget how far... I actually tested it, uh, mm -hmm. how far I could go, and I crashed the game after like two minutes, I think. <laughs> Whoops. So we had to we had to actually fix that. Uh, <laughs> I extensively but, play tested this game to make sure everything was but, uh, proper. For the fact that John has never played this before, he's playing really good. Also, we should mention then that I think one of the reasons why he's doing this good is the fact that the control scheme has been completely changed from yeah, the that's older that's game. key, right? It's actually a yeah. full two button game uh, with like you know no up to jump here. I mean, I, I know that's sacrilege to some folks. I'm sorry. But... You can still turn it on if you want it. But Wait, uh... really? I, I, I would probably prefer the original joystick setting, but it's, oh, it's good to jump. have like a there it modern... Is. Yeah. To have a modern uh, control scheme as well available as an option. Yeah, so this was something we worked very hard on getting right, was the fact that this new control scheme had to f feel natural for people who had played it before and for new it players does. and it then especially really new players had to immediately find it uh welcoming to play this and so every button actually has a uh, action now it's not just the b button to jump it's the fact that you have the special moves oh on yeah the different every, face every, buttons. you have direct like you can get uh r trigger to bring out the the, the rolling ball there yep uh the l bumper is the bomb thing oh so you just touch that spike and look at that is it another cool collection chris if it was ever possible via art type collection which includes uh, the uh rainbow arts art type oh yeah okay oh, yeah. actually you just touched on something that's really i would love to see more of is like a lot of times you have these classic japanese arcade games that receive pc ports hmm. i'd like to see more collections that included every port you know what I mean? Like, okay, you got the old, the old ZX Spectrum version in there. You got C64 <laughs> version in there. Like, that kind of stuff would be awesome. So, there's a Super Chat asking, What happens to Super Turrican 2? License issues and has Turrican 3 been, 
and had Turkin 3 be close to Mega Turk in order to make it into a collection? Okay, so I'll answer this quickly. So the game we're playing today is Turkin Flashback, which is the retail version, which is a smaller collection at a lower price for, and this collection is meant more for kind of moderate fans or newcomers, just kind of like quickly jump into Turk and see what it's all about at a more reasonable price. Whereas we are also working on the Turk Anthology, which is yes. a much more decked out and more complete collection. So this version, Turrican Flashback, does not have Super Turrican 2 and does not have Turrican 3 from the Amiga. And uh, I think the reason for this was basically just uh, via playtesting and just uh, some input from Factor 5. It's that these are kind of the essential experiences and Super Turrican 2 is very different. It's quite difficult. And uh, so... Okay, I'm playing this through the capture cards. I can't... Oh, there's just enough latency to make these jumps tricky. There is a bit of delay when you do the capture card stuff, which, uh, yeah, Turrican is not the best game to have a delay on. No. That's also yeah. good so you can go into the uh, setup menu and make changes while you're playing. That's cool. Yeah, and you can change... Uh, I, I actually hadn't seen this yet, so this is all new for me because I only saw like uh, like a, half a year ago, so I saw a very early version, so... <laughs> This yeah, it's exciting for me. It's to come see. a long way, hasn't it? <laughs> you basically, as I remember, you mostly just got like audio updates where it's like, hey, does this right. sound right? And it's like, yep, nope. So, exactly. uh, by the way, another super chat saying, Grand Monster Slam or Muds Bundle, please. <laughs> I would like to see some American PC, like, you know, Epic is huge now, but I'd like to see like the Epic Mega Games collection. With all of oh, their yeah. stuff like remastered or like you know properly done up for a modern platform, I'm actually surprised that something like Jazz Jackrabbit has not been re-released in I, the modern right? age. It's like, very bizarre. Seems, it seems like it makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, I mean, there's so much potential from the Amiga, the Com 64. Uh, not so much the Spectrum. It's, sometimes but, uh, it's also like rights issues, you know, with like yeah. some of the older classic games, rights are so spread between different entities. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to get everybody on the same table or some some don't even want to bother with it. So that could be a reason. Yeah, it's... Case uh, of Factor 5, it's, it was pretty straightforward. So that's the good part about it. Yeah, there were some, when producing this, there were some things that still had some licensing issues, but uh, for the most part, pretty straightforward. So, uh, another thing that uh, we haven't really shown off yet, but it's kind of cool, is that the uh, HUD can be made dynamic. Oh. So you can actually remove let's, the HUD let's take a look and at this. then oh, yeah. make it toggle ball. So if you just flick the right uh, stick, you can see the HUD, but... In, oh, and it, you know, it appears either up or down, depending if you press up or down. Yes, so you can have a full screen experience and, and a pretty pixel by perfect this is, form. Exactly, because this is cool, because with the HUD on, uh, you know, the, the play area is still wide like this, so it's basically mm -hmm. zooming in, so you get a larger full widescreen image, uh, but it doesn't, like, distort the graphics, which is key. Yeah. It's really good. So that was another kind of cool feature that uh, Rather Like uh, managed to get in there, which was kind of still essential because the thing about the Turrican games is that I think they still look the part, they still feel the part, but you still have to modernize them in some way. And I don't think like smoothing filters and things like this is... No, ever, I never liked this anyway. Like I never used them and I don't think they no. add anything to the experience, but something yeah. like this does add to the experience when you suddenly don't have a HUD, which is a fairly modern concept. Uh, many people prefer to play these games without the HUD these days. And uh, at the same time, it doesn't intrude at all with the presentation. Yeah. Oh, man. Pretty t this is a pretty difficult game. The one thing I always notice, Chris, when I play Turrican 1 is that it feels like a lot of the graphics are still kind of holdovers from C64. They kind of seem a little bit more simplistic, you know, color-wise. Also, new parallax. Well, was, yeah, what's the first... I mean, was coming from the C64 to figure out what the Amiga could do. And um, so you you probably see, like, quite a leap when when you then go to Turrican 2. Yeah. So there's a Super Chat there asking uh, why the remastered soundtracks aren't in this collection. 
So the uh, the thing he's referring to there is um, thanks for the question though. That. Is that in the anthology versions that are Let's coming uh, later in the year, uh, there will be an option where Chris has made new studio versions of the uh, all the tracks, every single track in Turkin. And, well, they uh, actually, yeah, they're based on the 2013 studio recordings. Right. You have updated really, a few of them. Remastered. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So there are some new things in there. I just want to kind of note that you have actually done a lot of work on. Oh, those yeah, 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 yeah. And every piece is touched because of the loops and everything. Right. And just updated some stuff here and there. So, but uh, yeah, the reason why it's not in flashback, again, it's just for, uh, for the fact that we wanted to get this out at a reasonable price, at a reasonable time, and coding that feature in is a nightmare, uh, because that has to all coincide with the original audio, and so we oh, yeah. are reserving that to the anthology. So, because it just simply needs a lot more testing, it needs a lot more coding, and uh, we couldn't get that done. Uh, that's not to say I we might as DLC or something like that, but I don't know about that. Yeah, because I mean, the anthology, it's not done. So. It's still being worked on, so, uh, yeah. you know. But uh, any questions you have, uh, just keep uh, keep them coming, and uh, if you have questions for Chris regarding any of his games, just uh, send them in. So yeah, we switched over to Turrican 2 now uh, yeah. to see some of this, and this, I think, is right. where, Chris, you first showed off, really showed off with the main title screen music using TFMX, like the full 7-channel uh blowout of music and it sounds incredible yeah i mean with, with tarik and two we i mean we had a hit with the first one and we wanted to excel on all levels with the second one and that included doing something special with the sound and a friend of mine a colleague uh who's who a really amazing programmer uh, had done a uh, full emulation of the Amiga sound chip on the Atari ST, and you remember the Atari ST has the same processor, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, but it lacked the Amiga sound chip. So he emulated that, and his code was very efficient so that it could actually run on the Atari ST. So that's when I had the idea hey, can't we take this CPU mixer code and port it back to the Amiga and then output that on one of the Amiga channels and use the other three untouched which uh, also was because uh, i had actually experimented with uh, cpu mixing but uh, the, the ones that i'd seen before the concept that i originally pursued was mixing two channels into each one of the four hardware channels oh. and that would give eight but then they all degraded they all sounded not as good as an original amiga channel for some instruments that would be really bad. You lose fidelity, like with with uh, sounds that have high frequency content, be it like a crash cymbal or a, um, a bell type sound, things like that. That didn't work out. There was one tracker, I think, to call the Octalizer that did it, and again, it, it just didn't sound good. And then when I saw uh, Jochen Hippel's um, uh, replayer on the Atari ST. That's when really the idea was born to use that, output it on one channel and then keep three Amiga channels original for those high frequency sounds. And that's the seven voice system. So we have some super chats there. Uh, first is from uh, Louis Martins, uh, amazing uh, pixel artist himself. Oh yeah. And uh, says, hi John, Audi, Chris, keep the retro okay, good, coming to Digital Foundry. Thanks guys. Well, thank you. Thanks Louis, good to see you. And then from Anna Nunon. Okay, I, I, I'm just gonna go with that. Uh, is the flashback collection all emulation or is there any native code being run? It's all emulation, but it's all new emulation. It does not use pre existing emulation or emulators. And, yeah. and there is new code to the extent of making these special features possible. Obviously. Yes, so it, it is running, I mean, it's running some native code on top, yes. And there's a lot of patching because you couldn't just like take the original uh, Amiga code with the discs and everything. You, you, you couldn't just like take that and plug it in there. No. And then some some graphics had to be uh, uh, replaced. Yeah, there are some uh, really? fixes, and I'm pretty sure well, like front that. Particularly. Yeah, uh, there, I'm sure the cutting room floor eventually will have uh, all that documented. But uh, definitely be on the lookout for some new touches. And I mean, there are some quality of life changes. Uh, the games were hacked 
uh, to have some fixes in there. Uh, I don't remember all of them, but as we did not have source access, uh, because that's lost. I mean, uh, Julian and uh, yeah, they don't have that at all, do they anymore? Team. They looked and looked and looked because obviously this would have been fun. But the the other issue too was why I mentioned earlier when it came to these games is that they are very much patched together to run and hopefully never crash. You know, it's just <laughs> back in the day you pushed the systems as far as you could with a lot of shortcuts, a lot of tricks. And uh, so as soon as you change one little thing, that can cause the entire game to just kind of crash. You know, and then it's over. So uh, there are finicky. some, yeah, there are some fixes in there. And I'm sure once the anthology is out, uh, we'll have a full list so people can actually know. So a modern vintage gamer also asked if the HUD option is in every game. I believe it is, yes. Yeah. Well, we'll have to check the other ones too, but yeah, yeah. here we go. Oh, so there's show, dynamic, and zoom. Interesting. Oh, okay. Yoros is asking about the soundtrack. How did it came to be? What kind of software hardware? Right. I actually developed my own soft music software um, together with a friend who helped me with the editor and that became the TFMX system. So it's similar to a tracker, but um, it's also in many ways different than a tracker. And um, yeah, and then uh, sounds, they came mostly from a synthesizer from Ensonic, the uh, ESQ-1. Uh, but I also oh, later yeah. had an uh, M1 workstation from Cork, mm -hmm. and uh, I had a, a self-built hardware sampler that was attached to the Amiga where I could um, create the uh, sound samples that I then would use in TFMX. So Sonny Frisch is continuing to buy his dinner today because he's been uh, super chatting like crazy, seeing Fallings, oh, Lionheart had also been beautiful. I mean, oh. uh, Lionheart is a very beautiful looking game. It's yeah, not... we checked that out on that one stream, right? The Amiga stream. Yes. It's the not Amiga great to stream. play, but it's it's absolutely amazing to behold. Yes, absolutely. And he also sends in a super chat just asking, you want Hipper? Yes, you want Hipper. So right, check, out, yeah. check out his album. Give so it a also, try. <laughs> give it a try. He, he, <laughs> was, he was really very gracious to um, give me this, this code of his mixing core um, because he he didn't need to do that but um, uh, that's I what I like about that era uh, though is you guys were all kind of like friends you know do, working together to come up with cool stuff it seems correct. like I love that so the friendly Ozone, colleagues the Oso Nightmare is asking question for all favorite game soundtrack from this era besides Turk and that is probably the worst question you can ask me because I love video game music. Oh yeah, I've dedicated a lot of my life to it. So, man, uh, so Turrican 2 was released in 92, 93? 91. Was it 91? Was it that early? Yeah. yeah. From that Don't era. Don't actually remember where, where to go here. Hmm. <laughs> You know, at the time I was playing a lot of C64 and NES, but I would have to say that during that time, uh, one game that came a little bit later was Power Blade on NES, which I oh. absolutely adore. And the Batman would be around this time. So Batman on the NES as well. And uh, the, the thing about Chris's music, I mean, I grew up very specifically a huge fan of Chris, because Chris was one of the few composers that was actually credited for his music in the video games. That you can see on the screen so he was the first one i ever took note of and i was a huge fan of his i mean and that was that was already kind of a thing in japan but like i guess in the west chris was kind of like one of the first to ever do that uh well he was definitely one of the first that was highlighted as well as he was and the in the japan it was less so but you had started seeing it with for example chris's contemporary yuzo koshiro oh that's right of um, course who are, is a good friend of chris of course and, and uematsu uematsu uh, you could find his credit in the, the games, so it was... Martin Galway, the, the, the early C64 uh, people. And I think at that time, um, you know, the name got out before the games. And I think that helped to establish that we would be credited. Yeah. Yeah, I even wrote you a letter when I was a kid. Uh, you never answered it. 
Okay, of I... course not. Yeah, yeah. I I was not a fan of like uh, writing letters. Uh, I read them all though. Yes, you maybe you read my. I don't think my English was very good at the time. So, but I do remember I had to send it, and I think the reason was uh, I had played Jim Power on the PC right. Engine CD for the first time. And I wanted to tell you how cool it was that you got to work in Japan. Because I had the idea that you must have moved to Japan to work on the PC Engine. <laughs> <laughs> that so... would have been great, yeah. And that was my first Redbook Audio Studio produced uh, soundtrack for a game. Yeah, do you and remember like? My favorite. Do you remember what it was like when you finally had the opportunity to work on the CD-ROM? Like, what were you told? Just like, make whatever and we'll put it on the disc, or like, how how did you approach that? Well, in this case, actually, it was a little bit more subdued because I just converted, or transcribed, or made studio versions of the original Amiga tracks from Jim Power. That's cool. But um, but then, like a few years later, I did. Um, first game where I had total Time. free reign and that was Tunnel B1 mm. and uh, that was my second uh, Redbook audio project and there I didn't have to base it on any Amiga tracks or something like that yeah uh, we should also dispel a rumor right here right now oh. you never you never worked on the CD TV version of Turrican Correct. Oh, so yeah. Isn't that just like a... Is, isn't, oh, Chris, you're only I, in third place know. here. <laughs> oh. On the high score table. Yeah, that sounds about right. Wait, yes, yeah, so you were saying about CD, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Chris? Yeah, I, don't even, I didn't even remember that there was a version. Yeah, there is a version on the CD TV. It doesn't have any enhancements whatsoever. That's, that's a missed chance, I guess. Um at that time you know the team had already moved onto consoles and it was probably just like a um, lame ass conversion yeah uh, the rumor for the longest time was that the studio album that you did of turrican back then you know back in the 90s was actually a canceled cctv soundtrack <laughs> no that's not true so that, that's oh a nice story God. though <laughs> Someone's asking why there's not a PC98 version of Turrican. Yeah, Chris, what's what's up? Why, why didn't you make? Oh yeah, I should. I'll, I'll let the PC98 version. I, I I have no clue. <laughs> uh, Turrican in Japan. I can talk a little bit about that, and you know, I think eventually woody san from M2 will probably watch the stream. Uh, so oh, yeah. hello. Uh, but because he's a huge fan of Turrican. Uh, but Turrican in Japan. Um, it's kind of interesting because it comes up in conversation when I work over there and do preservation work. And I think uh, you're running out of time. That's yeah. the reason why you're dying there. Yeah, he's a bit on delay for us. So. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so Turkey in Japan. Uh, it play. was actually only released once in Japan on the Super Famicom. Super Turkey was released uh, by a company in Japan. So. That's one the one game that they usually associate with this franchise. And a good game. Yeah. Let's see. So a super chat here. Hippo worked on Thalion, I know. Wings of Death and Seven Gates of Jambala. Uh, I have an old CD with his best words. Oh cool. Yeah. Oh wow, yeah. Right. Wings of Death, that was a really uh, big one, wasn't it? And that uh, was uh, that had a good following, I think, yeah. Yeah. And then another super chat from Solid Crusader 89 says, Hi there, just wanted to say the Division 2 PS5 upgrade is coming out February <laughs> 2nd. Are you guys planning on do a, to do a console comparison on that? Oh, I'm sure is somebody... Is Turrican playing, playable on that? So, somebody might do it. We'll find a way to sneak Turrican in there, though. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so there's a lot of... Uh, I, I can't keep up all the time, but there's a lot of uh, people making suggestions how to play Turrican for you, John. So they really care about you and want you no, to... No, that's good. I, I have not... So my history with Turrican, I mean, I had played the 16-bit console games more, but I never had an Amiga growing up, and I didn't really get a chance to play one until, I guess, two years ago, maybe? In 2019, I got that Amiga, and I yeah. played some on there, but... Uh, 
you know, the Amiga just wasn't big where I was from, you know, or from the U.S., right? Yeah. So, like, I really missed out on these games until very recently. Uh, yeah, I so, mean, when, when you and I started working together, I mean, yeah, it's been a you kind of helped mine. introduce me to it, and I really appreciate yeah, them, though. I've been pushing a lot of European uh, microcomputers on you, and uh, the this results one. have been pretty good. So, yeah. and that's that's a fun thing about VF Retro now, too, is that we usually do include a lot of uh microcomputer stuff yes episodes. i love it it's, i'm so, so glad that you helped get that in there because it kind of contributes to the overall picture that i think a lot of people had yeah uh, from yeah. back then i also want to make the point that this is like important since the amiga wasn't that big in the us and and many people have never <clears throat> been able to play this um the, the, this flashback and the anthology is uh, important for that reason so that people can actually experience it on modern machines yeah and and uh, get familiar with it and uh, that also opens hopefully the door for another Tarakan installment in the future like a brand new game of course and i think a lot oh, of people want that. to ask this question if there will be a new Tarakan. and i mean there's a lot of wheels in motion of course to make this possible and the one part of it is the fact that if these collections are successful then of course that would be awesome you know, the investors will feel like that there is something here so definitely uh keep that in mind when you pick up the game you're helping making sure that turk can come back okay, so just, uh, there it is that's the grapple a little different than actually on the mega drive itself okay so, but you make a good point though, Chris, because like these games, n most of them not released in the US or in Japan, and also today, <laughs> prohibitively expensive. They're most all like stupid expensive, aren't they? Like it's ridiculous. Uh, Mega Turrican is generally, you know, it's a two to three hundred and fifty dollars, yeah. and uh, Super Turrican 2, which I have signed <laughs> by Chris Holzbeck on Super Nintendo. Uh, <laughs> That one is now, I think, about 300 just the cart. Just the cart, yeah. Insane Getting insane a box price. version. But you also yeah, have Super Turrican for Super Famicom. I have all of them, yes. Which is I an amazing Super... box. Yes, uh, that has a cool like uh, rendition of Turrican on the front, which um, has not been seen before. And I really want to find an artist and figure out the rights, because I wanted that in this anthology, just the original uh, piece. You know, if it's out there still, we could not locate it. So if anyone has any information on who did that uh, illustration on Super Famicom, uh, do send it to me on Twitter, and uh, you will be helping us uh, figure that the puzzle out. So, but one thing we could do when we started working with Factor Five, and I say we, I mean, uh, I helped out a lot on this as a producer. But uh, one thing that we really wanted to do for these games was also re-release the games on cartridge because so many people have not been able to pick these up to play them on original hardware yeah so one thing we got to do was to do super turrican director's cut super turrican 2 and mega turrican on cartridge officially uh, with uh, all the fixes and everything and <laughs> Me being me, I had to go the extra mile and I hired some uh, new artists for those box arts oh. to differentiate them. So for the Mega Drive version, we got Tom Du Bois, who did the Castlevania and other... Uh, A lot of the, the Konami stuff, yeah. Konami, he was the Especially, Konami artist yeah. back in the 90s. And he did the new Turrican, which will soon be shown off to the public. And then for Super Turrican, I got my friend... Uh, Mike Winterbauer, who did the Power Blade yeah, that's uh, right. cover art to do with that. So I really just got my friends along, along with John. John was also a playtester for this game. So, and we'll talk a little bit more about what me and John are doing for the anthology later on. Yeah, exactly. It was, so, I really like the look of the uh, Mega Turrican here. This, this, dude, this, um, this is actually pers so I've heard talking to Turrican fans, you know, it seems like there's a big split between uh, people that prefer the Amiga, the one and two and the Amiga with the sort of exploratory level design and those that like what Turrican 3, Mega Turrican and Super Turrican 2 do because uh, they're fundamentally very different games. Hmm. Like this is more of a straightforward like this has more in common, I'd say, with like a Contra, or not even more like a treasure game, I'd say, where yeah. it's like there's well, a lot of unique scenarios. It's but it's still fairly straightforward, and it's not not really about exploring. It's just about surviving like really cool level design. 
uh, whereas, there we go, uh, Turrican 1 and 2 obviously are much more exploratory with the very wide open maps. Yep. Yeah, I, I guess you can kind of, if you want to make East comparisons, Turkin 1 and 2 are more like Metroids, like Metroidvania is almost. There you go. And then this is more like a Contra a type game. Influence, and, yeah. Influence, and I mean, this is also my favorite, I have to say, both uh, audio and yeah, uh, so gameplay. Good. This uh, might just be the best that Chris ever was. And I mean, you... <laughs> The fun thing yeah. about this is that this is a European developed game on the Mega Drive, a Japanese uh, arcade experience based console, which was uh, notoriously hard to get good audio out of for Western developers. Yep. And then you come along and you probably make the best soundtrack that the system ever saw. So, I mean, and it's one of your few. That's really high praise, particularly when you um, when you think about Yuzo Koshiro and his, his soundtracks, which I think are awesome. But um, yeah, this was definitely a challenge, but also, I mean, we, we, we had the time and we wanted to do something special. So, um, it, it, you know, I wanted to meet this challenge. So we tried our best to push the envelope as far as we could. And in fact, um, so the, the sound chip in the Mega Drive is uh, FM based, or actually it has several sound chips available. So there's the Yamaha FM sound chip, but there's also um, for compatibility with the master system part, there's an old PSG, which is like oh, yeah, the program really the old school. Yeah. And then we also wanted to have some uh, digital samples in there. And so uh, the uh, one of the kick-ass programmers from Factor 5 uh, did a sample mixer on the uh, second CPU that was built in it. It was also for the master system part. And normally you weren't even allowed to use that. So, um, but somehow it got through the um, checkup from Sega and they approved it. Uh, but it, that was like really crazy. So we have four, six FM uh sound chip voices then four psg and two sample voices so you have a total of 12 voices to play with and they all sound different and have a different character so it was really fun making that it's to me it's kind of amazing because when you listen to mega turk and now it actually reminds me of what some of like uh modern programmers have done with music on the mega drive you know like savage regime where like people they have like 10 20 something years of experience they really understand the system they've researched what other people have done and they've built this amazing stuff but mega turrican already sounds like a game uh that was built with like decades of experience basically which is... i think it's it's probably the closest we've come to our ideal of making a japanese game yeah think... because we were really fans of japanese video game um development and artistry yeah it's weird that i mean i can totally understand why this didn't get a release in japan at the time because the mega drive just wasn't really in in japan wasn't the same market for these types of games there no so right. the super famicom just made more sense but i think this game had it been released would have been more successful uh, because yeah. this is much more in line with what i think japanese uh, players we're expecting from the games of the time and he so you know it's a bit of shame but and and even arcade i mean if this had come out a few years earlier you could have done this on an arcade machine and that's true this type of game could have worked at put, the time. put in coins yeah yeah did that um, did you ever think of doing that back in the day to do a actual pcb arcade board for turrican we were always like dreaming of, about something like that for years. And in fact, Rainbow Arts had tried to make an arcade game, a true arcade oh. game. That became later um, X out, Z out, mm. uh, parts of that that game. But um, oh, yeah. It, yeah, at that time, arcade was also on its way out in a way. Yeah, it was. Oh, you have to use your grappling hook there. One thing that's interesting to me is like when obviously we're not going to talk about it too much here but one of the things you know we really learned during our interview sessions is how specifically a lot of the people that worked heavily on mega turrican were the ones that were the biggest fans of japanese games 
And also, I kind of learned that, like, in Europe, like, everybody seemed to have seen the PC Engine and was going nuts for it. It's, like, everybody's talking about, oh yeah, the PC Engine, we saw that, we all wanted it immediately, and it's like... But it never came out in Europe, and it's just like... I, it, it almost seems like it was this coveted object that anybody that was hardcore into games at the time really wanted to get their hands on. And for good reason. Yes. <laughs> It, it, it was the the problem was that uh, what wasn't that NEC that made the yeah uh, yeah and they were just not big as an electronics retailer or seller in Germany that was uh. all dominated by Sony and Panasonic <laughs> and uh, so I think they just concentrated on the Japanese market and uh, then then it was too late at some point and then Sony came out with the PlayStation and that was it you know that was the end of it yeah uh, it's a shame thing. yeah my my first console was in fact even though I was dreaming about having a PC engine when it came out I never jumped on it um, uh, but my first console was a PS1 oh so yeah, I... you did you did have a CVI as well didn't you <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't want to talk about that. There's, yeah, that, that joy of... I, so, there's a joy honestly, of game on there, I, and it's no, pretty honestly, good. No, honestly, I did not buy the CDI for um, for gaming. Not at all. I, How shocking. I wanted... Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, I just wanted the... This was like free uh, DVD. They had... Um, they had what, VCD. What was that called, actually? Video yeah, CD, was, right? Video yeah, CD. Video CD. And... Um, to me, I was a really, um, uh, I, I was collecting movies, you know, and, and VHS is s such a bad format to collect anything because each time you play it, it degrades. <laughs> so I thought like, okay, that CDI system, that looks interesting. And I liked, I mean, the quality was, yeah, on par with the best VHS, but it wasn't quite um, a DVD quality. It is it was, pretty good, though. Yeah, I mean, it's for pretty video. Good. It's an amazing system for its time. So, one thing that's kind of cool when the anthology comes out is that with your remastered soundtracks, this will basically become a mega CD game, finally. Right. Which it never had, of course. Exactly. In fact, this was also this has um, a, the title music of this uh, was not. Directly I'm part of the right now. I'm just gonna... <laughs> studio versions from 2013 because um, they use a few compositions kind of like mixed together, mm -hmm. and um, so I didn't make like a dedicated version. So we actually had to recreate that from scratch again. Right. Oh man, yeah, this is just. Uh... So speaking of the PC Engine, um, or just Japanese games in general, it's interesting because you've told me many times that you know you guys were playing Japanese games really hardcore back then. You know, R Type, of course, which you actually got to work on, and you kept up with the works of Yusuke Koshiro at the time because you were playing uh, you know Streets of Rage and these kinds of games. And Huge then eventually... fan of Act Racer on the on the Super Nintendo. Oh yeah, right, that yeah. that really that really blew my mind. And then I saw, oh, it's the same composer that had done Streets of Rage on the Mega Drive, and I was like, wow, this guy is good. <laughs> <laughs> and then eventually, you know, we became friends in real life and worked together, which is really cool. Yep. So, because your career and his career, you know, I actually uh, written a book about you. <laughs> Uh, your biography. I wrote that a few you years ago. You literally wrote the book yeah. on Chris. I r literally wrote the biography on Chris, uh, which I was very honored to do. And uh, but when we were going through your history and just kind of checking out, kind of you know, trajectory of your career, it was interesting because Koshiro's career has been very similar to yours. So you were kind of doing the same. You're the same age, uh, and then finally you meet up in uh, 2008. Was it the first time or? I Did think so. It was for time? some, yeah, symphonic shades. Yeah. He did an arrangement for the orchestra, um, and yeah, a few years ago. Cool. Uh, now it's more than a few years. Uh, uh, almost ten years ago now, we also went to the U.S. together, all of us, because uh, I brought Koshiro to a convention called Magfest. Oh yeah, and, Magfest uh, was amazing. You were there, and he was there. Yeah, the Kino Yamashita of Powerblade thing. It's all coming back. It's all coming full circle with these games. 
Uh, <laughs> but we had all these the legends there. That might have been the best year for Magfest just in terms of name value, because you guys, the three of you, pulled in quite the crowd. Yeah. And, uh, a lot imagine. of fun. And uh, it was basically, I was shocked because, you know, you and I have known each other for so many years. But that was basically one of your first proper uh, events in the U.S. to meet U.S. fans. Which, yep. you know, you've been in the U.S. since 95, and I was like, what have you been doing since then? It's like, I've been home. It's like, all right. And uh, we met so many of your U.S. fans there. They all seem to have come. Because you were signing Mega Turricans, and you were signing actual European imports, and it was crazy to just see how Absolutely. dedicated Absolutely. That, that, that show attracted the right crowd, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a lot of fun. And uh, then you did the panel with Bushiro as well, mm -hmm. which, uh, yep. yeah, it was just uh, awesome to see you guys come together and celebrate your careers. So Totally. Oh, we have a little intruder. No. <laughs> Remy's there. He's there. Turk and Junior. Turk and Junior. So, very unfortunately, I will need to wrap up pretty soon. Yep. Okay, before we do, let's so, quickly load up. If you have up, any uh, final questions, um, yeah, somebody yeah. earlier yeah. asked, Super. like, um, if I prefer the Amiga sound or the studio soundtracks. And that's really, you cannot really answer that. I mean, I'm so fond of the old um, Amiga style. But of course, uh, when you modernize something, then you fall in love with it all over again. And so um, it, it, they, they're very different. I think, don't think you can compare them. They both have their place. Yeah, yeah, I can agree with that. So one of the things I wanted, to, somebody else had mentioned this before, and I was curious to ask again on here was, um, can you talk a little bit about the Dolby surround support in the uh, Super NES game? What that entailed? Yes. So, um, of course, always looking to push the envelope. Um, uh, what's something else that we, we, we started to have, like, um, early home theater systems with um, receivers that had um, Dolby ProLogic. And uh, we figured out how that is actually encoded, which is quite easy. It's, um, you, you play it in stereo right. and then you invert one of the channels to... to um, yeah, to play an inverted version of the waveform, you know, and oh. that uh, causes the um, ProLogic to send it to the speakers in the back. And um, so we were able to, to support that. And uh, I think was, um, Julian, who then contacted Dolby and figured out that we could actually use the logo, that we did it properly. Ah, so, so it was a matter of implementing it correctly, and that's what earned you the Dolby Surround badge, basically. That's how I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. This is amazing. <laughs> I mean, this is a Super Nintendo game, and that, that you didn't see that uh, on too many games. So, uh, at least for me, this is the first time I ever remember seeing that logo on the game box. I'm sure people in the chat will come up with other examples where maybe he showed up. But for me, i never seen it before. Yeah, this was one of the first, and that would show up in a lot of the games you worked on, Chris. On N64, I think, there was Dolby Surround was in there, and then Dolby Pro Logic 2 on Rogue Squadron 2. Yeah, everywhere where you could have a stereo sampling, you know, like a left and right channel, and where you could um, do that, there, there we could support uh, that feature. Oh yeah, somebody mentioned Jurassic Park on Super NES. Yeah, which has a very good soundtrack, that game. It uh, does. I, that also has, has a, yeah. One up. Okay, do you want to get So the there was here? another question here about... Oh my goodness. <laughs> Whoa, whoa, whoa don't, don't game squeal like that. It's loud. loud. How do you is feel if your music functions? Is it loud, really? <laughs> yeah. Say hi, stream. <laughs> oh, we have, we're hi, having stream. more people in here. <laughs> 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 Hey, Rem, why, yes. why don't you tell tell them that this game runs at 60 frames per second? What? Say it. This game runs at 60 frames per second. This game runs at 60 frames per second. Yeah. <laughs> what so kind he of... wants me to say something. <laughs> he said it at 60 frames per second too. All right. What was the question, Chris? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, the question here by Marden was: With classic reboots popular, how would you feel if your music for Target was reworked? Like what Simon Dicklund did for Bionic Commando. We oh, are like oh. remixed. 
Yeah, um, I don't know, to be honest. If it's done well, I could I could imagine it to be pretty cool. Uh, for the most part, I would hope I could work on you know newer projects like that myself. I actually um, I would like to try to remix some of the target music in, in different styles. To uh, that would be something that I could. Um, I would like to hear like and a then Turk and acid jazz. It would be interesting to also have like guest remixes because so far we have only like done ones with um, you know we have hard work, heavy metal bands or whatever. But I could also imagine like um, having one one of the high uh, the name DJs do a remix. Why not? That would be cool. That would be cool. I see someone asking me specifically, will there be an Xbox version? And uh, we are working on it. Oh, good. Yeah, it'd be good to get this everywhere, I think. Yeah. Uh, other versions are forthcoming. So just keep checking uh, in in game, I guess, uh, websites. So, so yeah, now we're, now we're on the Super Nintendo and it has again like its own flavor. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. I always like the color gradients that's going And I mean, color gradients are very much the Super Nintendo strengths. Yeah, DMA everywhere. Yeah, but I really <laughs> like the atmosphere it gives to this specific game. That, like, the sunsets and whatnot that you see. It gives it a very different uh, feel, different vibe than the other ones, which are very light, either very light blue or, in Megaturk's case, it's very really dark. Yeah, and and the sound on the Super Nintendo also has its own flavor. The cool thing is that uh, it's uh, eight voices of samples, so very easy to convert from the Amiga. And in fact, um, it's, it's basically I was composing the music on the seven voice system for all the SNES pieces, and then uh, we tra transfer converted them over with a batch process. So I didn't oh. have to actually work on the uh, machine. I mean, I had it. I think I had it for checking it um, next to me. But the composition and all the work was actually happening in TFMX Amiga in seven voices, and then you had the um, you had the sound effects on the eighth voice. So for all the pieces are enhanced. And, um, yeah, it was pretty fun. And then it has this uh, um, early effects processor, which does kind of like an Echoey effect. And the reverb. Oh yeah, the, the reverb, reverb stuff. Type. Yeah, That's right. uh, it's more like an it's like more like a high-end echo with some extra features, but it definitely helps to give this like a total unique flavor. DSP. Very and clean. You've been on the record saying you really liked working on the Super Nintendo uh, sound chip. So. Oh yeah. And you also did, of course, Jim Power on Super Nintendo. Yes. Yes. Same. Incredible same. soundtrack. We used the same system there, yeah. So yeah, if anyone wants to check out some other works of Chris. Oh, seriously, the Jim yeah. Power it is an incredible soundtrack. Yeah, I mean, I was only originally familiar with that game due to the crazy scrolling, specifically on the Super NES version. <laughs> yes. But the actual soundtrack is phenomenal. It's really good. Thank you. So, with that, I unfortunately really have to go. Yeah. I still have stuff to do today, um, but um, this was really fun and yeah, it was um, really great that you could come on and join us. Yeah, are you gonna do another one like this uh, when the um, collector's sure. editions are coming out? Oh, of course. I mean, then uh, there will be a lot more to talk about for me and John on the that version. Oh, yeah. well, so then I'll definitely okay. come on again. If you oh, want to have we, me. We should have you back for other games. I mean, for... Oh, you crashed just that's, as you leave. <laughs> that's so weird. <laughs> All right, then. So, uh, but yeah. seven hand. But yeah, yeah. no, it was, we'll definitely would like to have you back on again, Chris. It's always fun. Okay. We'll definitely do that. Sounds and good. I guess, Audie, should we continue then? Let's for continue for another 30 minutes. So maybe just I'll... Uh, switch back to the intermission screen for a moment and then we'll uh, come back live once I reconfigure uh, the video so uh, we'll be back in just a moment all right guys thanks everyone oh there we go <laughs> we'll be right back
Okay, we're back. <laughs> After a quick little shuffle around, I had to sort of reshuffle the video there since Chris is no longer here. Um, but uh, so yeah, what what should we jump back into then? Well, which one did you enjoy the most so far? Well, I mean, obviously my favorite is Mega Turrican, but I've played that the most. So it's kind of interesting to play the uh, Turrican 1 and 2 because that's... I really have very little experience with these, so let's do that. Shame we don't have Turrican for the game boat. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah so we can talk a little bit about that actually because there yeah. are turrican games not on the collection i'm sure yeah. people are aware and i've seen some questions pop up regarding it and basically uh, of course the entire team wanted every turrican game and what i don't know the legalities or anything that's above my pay grade but what I could gather from it is that a lot of the contract work that was done via Rainbow Arts regarding different versions of Tur uh, Turrican for C64 or NES or these things are these do not go under the Factor 5 umbrella and as such it isn't as simple as just finding the ROMs and putting them on there there's uh, you know different people have worked on it some of them you know aren't around um, don't know where they are and just like legally it's still a bit of untangled so the question was then kind of like do we spend maybe a year figuring out all this stuff or do we make the collection as good as we can now and then you know maybe later do another run around and see where we're at with all this so that is the reason yeah that's that's a shame i mean the, the thing is is like these these are the best hurricane games i think that they've picked for the various collections but it is interesting to see what those other games are. Like, I think we sampled the uh, PC Engine version, or Turbo Graphics Turbo version. Turbo Graphics. Yeah, specifically. By, uh, by Phoenix Games uh, Legends, uh, uh, Code Monkeys. Uh, Code, Code Monkeys, Monkeys handled this, and they also handled what was a conversion of Turk in Universal Soldier, which, which um, is not great. Uh, not the best uh, conversion. A very interesting project for a Van Damme super fan like myself. And uh, I actually sure. spoke about this at length in the uh, Universal Soldier commentary I did for the Blu-ray. So right. if you are a fan of all this, uh, check out the 88 Films release of Universal Soldier to Return. And uh, you can hear me rant about it in the commentary track. But uh, yeah, there was the Universal Soldier one. There was the Game Boy one. Uh, there was the, the Turbo beam? Graphics one. Oh, and, the uh, beam. Oh, yes. And uh, there was also like Atari ST. There was uh, the aforementioned DOS version, which I find very interesting. Oh, it's so weird looking, isn't it? It's uh, yeah, it's unique. It is a unique Turrican. Uh, I mean, it's, it is Turrican 2, but it has new graphics, uh, different physics. And uh, was made by what we can decipher is like a Danish offspring of Rainbow, Rainbow Arts. Arts. Is it the same uh, one that did like Earthworm Jim 1 and 2, maybe? Yeah, exactly. Uh, they would eventually go on to do uh, a port of Super Star Wars that never came out on DOS. That's right, yeah. And then they would do Earthworm Jim, which is a really good port of Earthworm Jim. It's a super good port. PC. Actually, their version of Earthworm Jim 2 is the best version of Earthworm Jim 2. Because yeah. they actually cut out content uh, that I think was not good. So exactly. It's actually a better game. I had never polished. heard of uh, yeah I never heard of this Earthworm Jim version until he showed it to me and then he showed me exactly this I was like yeah this, so this is the best version I was like yes it is <laughs> so uh, that is by Rainbow Arts it's very uh, we have actually kind of uncovered a bit of a strange legacy of uh, Rainbow Arts the last year as we've been picking yeah. up games from that from Darius Gaiden to that's right they did Darius Gaiden on PC uh, yeah in on Europe. PC. Zero Divide, like one of my favorite PlayStation games, Zero Divide. I can't believe um, they did that. was handled by Rainbow Arts uh, so Europe. Weird. So I actually had to pick that up because I, I couldn't believe it. Uh, so And I mean, Zero Divide in general is very interesting. Probably one day we'll get its own time. I would love to. I, I really like those as well. You're right. Like I gave that a look after you talked about it, and they're really cool games. Especially the Saturn version. That yeah. is like a Virtua Fighter 2 with robots. It's very strange, but uh, 
that uh, this guy's definitely are, cool. Some cool stuff for sure. I love it. Oh yeah. So yeah, the code monkeys and their ports of Turrican. Uh, they also did Turrican one on uh, Mega Drive. There is a Genesis version That's of right. Turrican one, which has uh, really bad music, <laughs> very bad music. See, they committed the sin that we were saying yeah. you should never commit. They uh, graphically also it's very kind of uh, faded out and weird and uh, I know that the ROM hacking community has actually fixed almost everything there is like a Turrican plus version on Mega Drive via ROM hacks I don't think it fixes the music though so I guess with an MD plus patch you could finally get it to be uh, presentable but uh, that was actually uh, interesting. Uh, the Turrican 1 port for Mega Drive was handled by um, the same people who did Bubsy, Accolade. And came out around the same time, so it has a similar packaging. The uh, paper Oh, box. it's the, the box, yeah. The box, yeah. So, More like a PC game. <laughs> more like a PC game. It came with like postcards and everything inside. And uh, of course, is an unlicensed cartridge. Because at the time... Accolade did not have a license. Oh, that's right. Isn't there like a non-licensed and licensed version of Bubsy? Yes, there that's absolutely thought. is. So, and I have both. Someone's saying that they're working on their own patch for Mega Drive Turrican 1. Ooh, let them all keep me posted on Twitter what you're doing with it. I would love to see the uh, community uh, fix that version. Uh, I had the PC versions of Earth and Jim 1 and 2. 2 had Redbook audio, but didn't have Lorenzo soil. Yes, other cuts were made, and I never yeah. broke the controller. I was <laughs> angry. <laughs> Alright. That's right, who, yeah. Who would like to see a live-action turret movie? It exists. It's called Steel, starring Shaquille O'Neal. Oh, I was thinking of... Um, uh... Oh, I can't. I can't forget the. I forget the name now. There's some Japanese film that I've seen that was like hmm, that could be like Turrican. Many of them. If you think of like Actually, the Tokusatsu. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, which I mean had some influence on Turrican. Uh, also, no doubt. So, because they were just soaking up everything they saw. Oh, there we go. We got the super Turrican style um, orange background. Really like this shade of color here. That, it's that red. beautiful, right? Like it looks yeah. awesome. I'm really happy for me who grew up with these games. I'm really happy that this collection exists, and it was one of the reasons why I jumped on a chance to actually work on this. Because normally I don't work on projects with other companies so much, uh, and but I jumped on this because the fact that like we could bring Turrican back and have the controls remastered so people could play it and enjoy it with modern controls and just make them available worldwide for the first time because it is kind of like one of these classics that no one has played right everyone yeah. knows about Turrican. everyone has heard the music and knows it's amazing but i think the whole package is there uh, it's not the best game ever made so to speak but as a whole package i think it's an incredible game that needs to be seen, needs to be played and experienced, because this was beyond what any other European developer at the time could have put out. I mean, That's these guys right. were, were ahead studying of the game. Japanese video games and then made one to compete with them, which generally would not happen from a Western <laughs> studio. I mean, the rare is the closest you can find, and that is only, I think, you know, three years later or four years later with uh, Donkey Kong Country. So. Yeah, absolutely. And you can really see how they evolved from each Turrican. It got closer and closer to a more Japanese-style action game, and then Super Turrican 2 is just insane, what they tried to do with that. It's yeah, and borderline, I, like, cinematic at times. Like, there's so much stuff that happens in Super Turrican 2. Yeah, it almost feels like an early prototype of what would become, like, these cinematic actioners from, like, Naughty Dog and stuff. Yeah, a little it's bit. Not, it doesn't have the cutscenes necessarily, but no. what it has is the set pieces. Like, it's treasure-like when it's, it like, is treasure -like, every like, yeah. boss is, like, its own event and must be de dealt with differently. It's a little and, bit uh, alien soldier-ish. In that yeah, regard, exactly. Where, like, big, super fast, hardcore action, and just yeah. lots of variety, and stuff is changing constantly. Yeah, and uh, I think Super Turrican 2 is an awesome game and uh, amazing in its own right. But I do, 
I can also see kind of like how it goes a little bit too far in the direction. Yeah, away yeah it's very different. Again. So, uh, which is why I think Factor 5 felt that the flashback collection uh, didn't need it. You can definitely pick these games up, though, on cartridge at uh, strictlyintogames.com uh, with new box art. And uh, you should, because the originals go for hundreds wow. and hundreds of dollars, and uh, yeah. that's just the card. And these new versions are updated uh, by Lutz Ostekorn from Factor 5. He's taking care of the new programming for it and uh, has new box art. And as we have seen with a lot of these re-releases in Japan from like Columbus Circle and such, with like Blade Lancer and Mad Stalker recently, uh, both of our, our Game of the Years on the list. Oh yeah, heck yeah. And uh, those games kind of climb in uh, value very quickly. I mean, Blade Lancer, the reprint, is now not <laughs> uh, very cheap. It's not cheap, like is that. it? It's like, no. it's maybe like half the price of the of the original cart, but the original yeah. cart's like a three or four hundred dollar game yeah, now. Exactly. So uh, if you're interested in collecting carts and you're kind of on the fence, we'll probably make sure you get these because Super Turrican 2 is not going down in price anytime soon. Also, I, I was happy that it seems like uh, Strictly's using a good supplier for the PCBs. Yes, Dragon Box. So, so you can be sure that it is not the wrong voltage and these things. And yeah. I mean, this is something when I joined the project was very important was that packaging, PCB, beveling, all these things are proper. Yeah, because that's a... Uh... A lot of cart repros have used like uh, just the generic AliExpress or Ali, yeah, AliExpress yeah. Uh, PCBs, and they're not great. It's not great. <laughs> and, uh, they're getting worse. So that's the sad part about that. Is that you would hope that you know with the popularity of um, you know the aftermarket now, that uh, maybe you know the quality would go up because nope. it's more manufacturing. But uh, the opposite has happened. And we're seeing more and more claims that like these things are, you know, either frying or make some sort of damage to you. Know, you know, that's it's just really a, disturbing. So, yeah, um, think twice before you buy repros. That's uh, my collector speaking. Yeah, just out of as, as for fun, I did buy one of those like cheap eBay knockoffs, or it's just like just to see what it looked like, and the quality was, I'd say, dramatically worse than I ever imagined. Yeah, like it's just the cheapest material, low quality circuit board. It's, they're not, they're not good. Let's see if I missed. Uh, we've been talking so much that I might have missed some questions. So oh yeah, I'm gonna make sure of that. Just yell at me if you have sent in anything. Yeah, the, we did read it, but uh, fine for now. One thing they really went nuts with them, like the palette of the background. When I like, I'm gonna rewind. You fall all the way from the top. It's like red, purple up there. You drop down. It's just like green, blue, purple, pink, blue. Like it's just like it's it's incredible how how many colors they cram into that background. I'm very curious how it's generated actually. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm guessing that's a good question for someone like Lutz or Billy. I saw Billy Baka was in the uh, chat earlier. Oh, Billy was here. So, uh, hi to Billy, and another member of the I think I saw um, uh, Andreas was here as well. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, I share. A good friend and a fantastic pixel artist. Worked on a lot of the uh, Game Boy ports for Factor 5, Andreas. And yeah. He did amazing work for like. Like uh, the Pro Contra Pro Alien Pro. Wars for Game Boy, yeah. which is a really cool conversion. Yeah, great conversion. And he also did like Animaniacs yep, yep. and uh, things like that. So a really good pixel artist. If anyone needs a good pic classic pixel artist for your homebrew game, hit up the Andreas uh, Someone was asking if we can talk a little bit more about the anthology documentary. And oh, I'm yeah. Sure, of course. So the documentary that me and John are working on, we've already taped uh, hours and hours of footage with uh, various members of Factor 5. Yep. Uh, luckily, they're still all with us. That's right. And uh, their memory is still quite good. And uh, we are still trying to figure out some more interviews because of COVID. This has kind of been halted a little bit. It's, yeah, it's difficult. We can't do right. anything about that. 
Uh, but uh, we can definitely assure you that you're getting the entire story with Turk in here uh, and then much more. And that was really fun, you know, for example, talking to Lutz Ostokon, who worked on Mega Turk, and it's really fun to hear his stories, for example, of how. Yeah, I was really, like, you know, I knew that Lutz had been heavily involved back in the day, but I didn't realize just how much he actually did on Mega Turk, and especially. Yeah. And it's like. He was absolutely central to the game's design. It's fantastic to learn all about that stuff. As someone was saying, the background colors are called copper bars. Effects used in demos a lot. Also called raster bars. Oh, okay. Let's look into that. I mean, yeah, the demo scene I, I don't know. It's, it's huge. Uh, it's, my knowledge uh, of the Amiga hardware itself is pretty minimal, to be honest, again. Because I only recently got into it in any way, so... Yeah. Uh, but it is a, it's it's kind of it's a platform I've been very impressed with seeing, and I need to try out a, a cr somebody created a, an XMB style menu. For, oh, I saw it today. Uh, the yeah. Amiga, and the creator actually sent me the link. Like, dude, you should check this out. And I'm like, I will definitely check this out. Cause Which is was... just insane. <laughs> I love the Amiga community, and uh, you know, the people are super nice in there, and oh, have yeah. been for you know, the 40 years and 30 years. And, uh, you know, for example, our good friend MVG is very much into the Amiga still. Oh, and yeah. uh, with my work for Chris over the years, me and Chris uh, have worked together for almost 15 years. Uh, so I've been to a lot of shows with him uh, dedicated to the Amiga. And it's just amazing that this whole community and the original creators, of course, still with us and uh, having fun with it. So. And uh, that was another fun thing while we were doing the documentary. One thing to talk about is uh, we talked to Frank Matske, who works uh, for Bethesda. Yeah. And you know he was very much involved with Turk and especially the Super Turk and Mega Turk. And, and over the years, you know, he's worked on great games from Bethesda. And uh, kind of, I think, I think he felt he had kind of moved on a little bit. But then when we started doing the documentary, started playing the games again with him, and all this. It was fun to see just how he was rediscovering his love for all this yeah stuff. it, it so, just kind of came back in a way it was really fun to see it's just like he had hours of stories for us yeah absolutely that's going to be the tricky part about cutting that thing i think is yeah. just figuring out all right what can we reasonably include in this thing that's not everything because i'd love to include everything but it's not feasible it's, yeah, one well, interview is like you know sometimes three four hours yeah, so uh, yeah you know, that would be a one-man show then and uh, i mean we taped an interview with chris uh, a couple years ago now at your place yeah that's um, right you can see parts of it on uh, digital foundry you should go check out oh yeah go foundry chris olspec on your search bar and watch it uh, it's a really good interview that they did with him and uh we also taped with him back then about five hours collectively of uh, interview footage yeah he sat uh, in the chair for a long time he sat in the chair <laughs> in front of those lights uh for a long time that's right and uh, talk about his entire career and of course turk and to a significant extent so i mean him alone could have been a story and i, I should know i wrote the book on it but uh, as such, we still have to um, make a documentary out of all of this and uh, cut off all, all this footage. But uh, I think it's going to be quite fun. Uh, it might take a little bit longer than expected just because of COVID, but that's just... Yeah, exactly. Game. And, you know, I want to make sure it's done right, basically, to get the best info out there because, you know, we both care a lot about this kind of stuff. So uh, it comes from a place of love, that's for yeah. sure. See Thomas uh, Nickel is in the chat. Good old oh, Thomas. I'm, I'm doing terrible at this right now. This game is brutal. I really need to. And I think uh, Thomas actually reviewed this game for M Games in Germany. That's right. New home country, and uh, he gave it a must-have. So uh, high praise for the professor of video games, Thomas, who is actually a professor of video That's games. That's true. He is a teacher at. The I academy. love that. <laughs> can actually say he's a professor of games one of my fun funniest memories with him will always be uh putting on about 30 or so phoenix games in front of him and say oh. evaluate these games for me professor and then getting an academic uh answer to all of our phoenix games questions 
Short so. story, they failed. They all yeah. failed. <laughs> he hasn't been back since. And then we discovered there was an iToy game this week. There is an iToy game from Phoenix <laughs> Game, which will absolutely show up in our much touted iToy episode, which oh, it ha it I has to. announced on Twitter without consolidating John at all. I'm okay with doing something on the yeah, iToy. I'm all I have in. It. So, what the, are you into doing something about SingStar? Because that that was a Scandinavian uh, PS2. I don't know. I mean, there. what is the chat thing? Do they want to hear me sing? I mean, Do they want to hear me sing. So, yes. Cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, there was uh, here in Scandinavia for PS2. It was like iToy was huge. I'm not. Uh, there's kind of disputing numbers online. Uh, how much it sold around. It's some say 10 million, and then I saw much lower numbers other places. But here in Europe, and especially Northern Europe, Sweden, Norway, iToy was huge. And then we got something later called Buzz. Are you familiar with Buzz? Oh, I've seen Buzz, yeah. It's yeah. like that weird puppety looking thing on the front. It looks like a puppet, yeah. And then you get uh, these uh, buzzer controllers. It's basically just a one button controller. Where you hit the buzzer and then you oh, answer the, the question. Hence the name, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And there was millions of those games. Millions. I saw and they were all like, you know, budget like ten ten dollars. They were all in like Phoenix Games territory, but yeah, better. Yeah. But they were all quiz games, which Japanese quiz games they have a lot of love for. But the European ones not so much. I have a love, love for games. also for you don't know Jack. I always thought that was fun. Oh you don't know Jack, yeah. Who wants to be a millionaire? Maybe we should do that. Should do like a DF Retro on game show games. Jeopardy, <laughs> Wheel of Fortune. We could frame it and film it as a game show. Exactly. You see, th this is why you got the big bucks. This, this is... Oh. Man, though, what what didn't have the big bucks... But, okay, so one of my big complaints with Turk in these, these original games is the way they handle hits from enemies. Where it's just like, if you just stand over an enemy, your life bar just goes down. Like, there's no hit effect, there's no st There's just nothing. It's just like, your life just drains. when you're. If you stand over these pixels, the bar goes down. Yep. It's really nuts. Oh, you know, I always I, like their music, you know, in this section. The underwater sections. It's it's weird. I didn't have, uh... Because I didn't have Turrican when I was young, but I actually do. I still have it. I got a... I, I purchased Thexter back in the day oh, yes. for my PC okay. from Game Arts, right. but it was actually the American version published by Sierra. Oh, and uh, I loved Thexter. That was yeah, a, yeah. That was a really cool little game. So someone uh, earlier uh, tried to ask me about uh, something about Loaded. Oh, now hi Audi. Do you think we'll see a Lotus trilogy flashback or Shadow of the Ooh. Beast trilogy? Yeah, so that's the thing, is that now that we've opened the Pandora's box and gotten Amiga back on the consoles, uh, there's so many games that I would love to see come back in these anthologies. And I think Shadow of the Beast is definitely high on that list, even though I think Shadow of the Beast 1 is not a good game. It's a technical showpiece, but uh, game-wise, not so good. Isn't that, isn't that IP now owned by Sony? I believe so. Because they, they actually remade that um, yep. some years PS4, back. That's, which is a great game. Yeah, it is. And that one's interesting because that has a... Uh, you can actually unlock or discover the original, the original. Yeah. piece. But it is apparently not the Amiga version somehow, some way. Uh, apparently it doesn't use emulation. So I'd be curious to hear... Uh, this is just what I heard oh, yeah. from yeah. developers, but I would be interested to hear what it actually is doing for that original version then. Um, yeah, I wonder. The, there's a lot of know, like cool versions of Shadow of the Beast 1. I mean, there's the Lynx yes. version, which is surprisingly impressive. There's PC Engine CD, Mega Drive. The, uh, the PC Engine version is definitely the one that I'm interested in. So The, the PC Engine CD version is really good, except for it has... Uh, Whenever you go between areas, there's a noticeable loading time. Right. I mean, Which, as you might I expect, mean, but, you know, it does slow the pace a little. And there's also Shadow of the Beast 2. I have that on the Sega CD, which is an interesting version. Yeah, so, uh, so that version is really interesting because 
that is a very different type of game. Uh, yeah. A very much a sprawling adventure game with like voice acting and uh, Miami Vice uh, music. So. <laughs> Soundtrack is awesome they, in that actually. Very good, very good music. So yeah, Shadow Two and then Shadow Three, which I think Shadow Three is the kind of black sheep. Uh, I don't think it was even yeah. supposed to be a Shadow game to begin with. It doesn't quite seem like it. So uh, that one, you know, definitely be interesting to have every version of that on a game card. I definitely agree. I think that's uh, kind of the next big one that should be. I would revived. love that. That would be that would be neat to see. Especially if you could get all the different versions, which I know is tough, but it would be so cool. I think they, uh, because Sony owns all of it, though, I'm pretty sure they consolidated the rights uh, much more proper uh, because Sony doesn't screw around so much. That's so true. Maybe yeah. it could be easier. So, man. That is I, it's actually, you know what? Shadow of the Beast, that is actually an Amiga game that I played back in the day. Only because my cousin actually had an Amiga. It was the only place where I had ever seen an Amiga. He had an Amiga, and I remember playing on one of those little, like, generic little joysticks. Uh, you know, it's like the tan-colored one with the button on top and the little metal rod. Up in, I, I don't know, you've seen them all over the place, but uh, I remember seeing that and being kind of blown away because it was at a time when I, I didn't... My only familiarity was with our home PC, really, and, like, Apple IIs and such, and... Uh, seeing what the Amiga could do in comparison was like whoa, a big difference. Because at the time, I only had a PC that was an IBM model, a PS2 model 30 or model 25. Yeah. So it was an 8086 processor, with MCGA graphics. Dexter ran, but you know, and I played Double Dragon in CGA. <laughs> I remember you told me that. Which, oh, that's. Which that's uh, the... makes uh, makes an uh, appearance in the Usagi Yimbo DF Retro. That that's was right. Oh, that was I a good. Think. That was a good episode. That was the first one I edited. In yeah, you edit, yeah, you edited that all yourself, actually. And uh, oh, well, out... sir, uh, you uh, did some cleanup. Just, Let's just a fair. little, just a little cleanup. <laughs> just a little cleanup. Uh, but that was a huge uh, yeah i was um, very honored uh, to not only being able to do yusagi yimbo which a uh, comic book i love but also df uh, having that trust in me so uh, i really love that video so if you haven't seen it go check out yusagi yimbo didn't you DF actually Retro. get contacted about yes, that Stan, Stan Sakai Stan contacted Sakai me. actually reached out that's amazing he reached out and said he saw the episode and was really happy and uh, I was uh, quite emotional that day, as you remember. That's so. Um, that's that's just. It's wonderful. So yeah, that was fun. Yeah, speaking of still Amiga compilations, though, I think also something like James Pond, which you know, I'm not the biggest fan of James Pond, but I think historically, uh, if you could get all those games together, not just James Pond Two, which has been remade uh, up to the heavens. Yeah. Uh, but actually everything, including that sports game on Mega Drive. So, uh, I don't th I so I, re I recently played more of James Pond 3. Oh. James Pond 3 is not a good game, but it's an interesting game. And I, I, I think it's neat what they were trying to do, and you can see that they were pushing... They were really, like, using the Mega Drive in interesting ways, but the game balance is terrible. It just... They, they actually ran into that problem that a lot of developers did when trying to emulate Sonic, where Sonic has a roll, so, like, enemies come, you roll, you go through them. James Pond doesn't have a roll. So when you start running quickly, uh, anything that gets in your way pretty much just equals, like, death. <laughs> I see the professor's knocking on our door on Discord. I'm not sure if we're streaming long enough to add him in, though. Actually, why don't... How about... While, while we're still here, let's let's bring in Thomas Nickel, the professor, for a little bit. Uh, I'm going to switch to the intermission mode real fast, and then we'll be right back with another guest. So hang tight.
and we're back. And uh, this time we're joined by the professor himself, Thomas Nickel, who has uh, also <laughs> Hello, done. Everybody. That's right. You've been in the chat already, so. Yeah, uh, hello. Welcome. It's good to have you on for Thanks the first for time. You. I mean, for our, our German viewers, you would be pretty familiar, I think, because you write for... I write for M Games, which is, uh, at this moment, Germany's oldest surviving games magazine. Right. It's print with dinosaurs. <laughs> Are you doing the Lord's work? Because well, you do a lot of great work. Yeah, and, uh, I agree. A lot of interviews Thank with you Japanese... Very much. Uh, yeah, you do a lot of good work, and I, I actually knew of you before we met, so to speak, because I was familiar with you from the uh, days of uh, the symphonies when I worked that. So, yeah, we, we met and never realized. Never realized until I found a picture where it's like, isn't that you? It's like, yes, all right. <laughs> That's right, there's so, a picture of you guys together, or like in the same yeah. area, basically. Yes, uh, with <laughs> Umatsu. <laughs> photobombing uh, uh, photobombing the whole thing so but yeah thomas uh you actually reviewed this game for m games uh pretty yes, recently uh, is that issue out yeah, already it's, uh, it's out it's out since uh for, for one week now it came out last friday so uh yeah what was uh what was your score i think i said it earlier that uh, there was i gave it uh, an 85 which is um the mark you need to cross to get the uh much coveted uh, end game recommendation seal. Yes. Uh, so we got the must have from yeah. end games, which uh, I know the team was very happy about. So. Yeah, that's nice to hear. And I mean, uh, you were definitely someone Especially that I can't. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, you were someone that I came to a lot during the production anyway, because I mean, you also grew up with these games. Uh, you have a lot of knowledge on game design and just kind of what makes a good game so it's very helpful to have kind of your input on a lot of this uh, as we went along so yeah you somewhat uh involved in the production as well just not directly so to speak tiny. that's right yeah tiny bit. Tiniest which was fun bit of... really tiny in, in real life because if i would have been more involved in the production of course i wouldn't have done the review myself because i gotta say uh, we we Yes, we avoided the conflict of interest by me not saying what that was actually asking you for. <laughs> so this was uh, yeah, that's very, very necessary because we really needed that must-have. But uh, yeah, no, it was very helpful, of course, and uh, as usual, you're always helpful. So it's always good Thank to you. talk to you. I mean, but, uh, I I'm just glad that these games are back in circulation now and it can be played without uh, absolutely, going yeah. through all the cattle with emulation or getting original hardware to run nowadays. So uh, oh, already we have a very important about. question here. Uh, how relevant was Strip Poker 2 for the Amiga, Professor? Again, it didn't Ooh. get it. Oh. What was the question? Oh, uh, what, how important was Strip Poker 2 for the Amiga oh, as a game? Strip Poker 2. Professor, what do you say? <laughs> I didn't get the name of the game, man. Strip, strip Poker 2. Oh. Of course, it was very important because, as we all know, the platform that offers spawn is the platform that will survive in the end, that, that will strive. I and mean, this when is the how the beat the HD DVD. <laughs> yes. It did now, well. It did yeah. well for itself, I think. Uh, there was a poker game on the Amiga, which is relevant to this discussion, which was uh, Hollywood Poker Pro, uh, which has music by none other than Chris Holzbeck. So, uh -huh. um, don't Google that, though, if you have children. But uh, that it's uh, one of those secrets that came out eventually about uh, Chris's uh, career. He did that as contract work. Uh, he did not know oh, what he was. Young and needed money. Yeah, he was just uh, taking work uh, for anyone, and he did not know what he was composing for. Uh, it didn't have a name. It was just, can you make this type of music and this type of music? So this this game, but, <laughs> this game was so brutal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so when you were playing these again, where are you at the moment? What's uh, that? When you... Thomas? You're playing Titan 2, right? And you yeah. are in the, the second world, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Anyway, go ahead, Audi. Yeah, I was going to say, Thomas, when you were playing these again now after all these years, what was kind of your thoughts on them as games? I mean, because uh, when you were reviewing it, of course, you're reviewing it as a compilation. 
Uh, but I'm curious what you're thinking of, for example, Turrican 1 and 2 especially. Uh, how do you think they hold up as video games? Well, I think Turrican 1 is a bit archaic in many regards because it has many, uh, many um, uh, instances where you get, uh, where you can't almost uh, avoid getting hit by the enemy, for example. Right. Um, and it's yeah. just so huge and so sprawling. It's. Uh, um, I, I wouldn't say it conforms to modern modern game design uh, philosophies, but it's uh, it's still fun if you get into that mood and into that uh, spirit of the of, the, of game of this vintage. And uh, then Terrigen 2 is such a big step up in every regard. It's amazing, I think. I mean, it still has its moments when you have, for example, you jump up a narrow uh, a narrow path and you get hit from above and you can't see what was before you. But then you find out, okay, I have to play this game a bit more slowly. I have to go up there maybe inch by inch, uh, be careful, use my uh, my yeah. surround laser and stuff like that. But then I do that and then I get killed for the time limit at some point. Yep. That has already happened so to that me was this one evening. Thing to note. <laughs> yeah. Because oh. once more, it's. it's you sprawling levels. Okay. So, uh, Thomas, what did you think of the, the updated controls then when you were playing them now oh, with was, the new control scheme? I was so glad about that because, I mean, I think we can all agree nowadays that uh, jumping by pressing up or moving the joystick up doesn't feel good out of a fighting game. Especially no. when you play a game of platform, I focus. You do want to jump on a button and just making the jump to the button already was a huge improvement. I'm I'm not too sure about um, all the mapping of the special attacks to the other buttons, but maybe it's just because I'm still in a, in a way used to uh, using uh, certain attacks by crouching down and uh, holding the button or stuff like that. And yeah. uh, I'm also quite used to still um, using the wheel by just uh, kneeling down and pressing uh, the button again. Oh so yeah, yeah. Space in the, with the yeah, so this was actually something that, yeah. like, while we were playtesting it, uh, kind of came up in how to handle these. And it was just that we felt that the people who weren't that familiar with Turk and who were younger players on the team, when they were playing it, you know, they fell into the category of, like, they preferred it on the button. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of just kind of. Yeah, so we just had to kind of make that decision, oh, yeah. and it's like, well, uh. You know, of course, someone like me too, I'm used to crouching and pushing that button, of course. But that's because I've played it a hundred times before. And so it's not for me that I'm doing this. It's for the people who haven't played it a hundred times. And that's kind of how we came up with the fact that uh, these things were changed. Yeah, and I think that also the right yeah. But uh, I don't know if you're like me, but I, I have a hard time going back to the Amiga versions now playing them just because a little bit. these update versions are so much more approachable. Of course, it's easier. You just put the game in your Switch and play it. And uh, I find myself playing it quite a lot at night just because it's available to me. And I have been doing so for the last six months. But, uh, you know, most of the controls and all the, just the small fixes that I'm noticing, it's like, I don't know if hooking up your Amiga and running the games across you know a couple of floppies is it's nostalgic yes and of course there is a atmosphere to it that can't be replicated perfectly yeah, yeah. but i think with the crt filter and the updated controls is that as close as a compilation can come to rendering the original almost uh that one thing i'm going to ask you about actually so when i played hurricane 2 i got to uh, my beloved shooting stage i just love that stage because to me it's a shooting stage and uh the music is just awesome exactly in the first uh part of these um, in the original there used to be this little uh the enemies with a banner that says kataki's lips lips yeah did you remove that i don't think that's removed no i didn't see it oh Huh. Maybe I, I, uh, I never, certainly I never made the call to remove it, so this must have been. Fun. Um, I'm pretty sure it's still there. There would be no reason. Maybe I just killed the enemies too quickly. Like that. Here could be. You're too good. That's like the <laughs> ultimate flex. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, that is a fun Easter egg in those two. And those shooting stages are really cool. Um, yeah. We haven't seen them today. I'm sure uh, next time John plays this, he will be 
fully trained and able to get to the shooting stage. That's right, yeah. Those also um, showed up in uh, Gunlord, which was kind of like, yeah. the, uh, I guess you could say, uh, a spiritual kind of follow-up kind of game, you know, a fan game made from an NG dev team here in Germany. That yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it feels it feels very Turkish indeed. We nailed the atmosphere. Very old school Turkish. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if I would have made the game like this, I we would have split each level in three parts because it's just it's really again so beyond this question. Yeah. Yes. The, the position, what they went for. I forget who did the music for Gunlord. Is it Raphael Dim? Yeah. yeah, I know that the uh, good friend of Chris and good friend of ours, Fabian Deb Pure, he did some work on Gunlord for Switch. Oh, for Gunlord yeah. X. That, yeah, that's right. Because Gunlord was originally, like, technically a Neo Geo game, I guess. Yeah. And then it was done on Dreamcast as well. And. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And again, well, one funny thing I, I would like to tell one funny story about that shooting stage in Turrican 2. Sure. Um, after we played it for the first time at Turrican 2 back many, many, many years ago, um, we were just so happy that there is this horizontal for the shooting stage. And from then on, uh, it became a joke among me and my friends that every game, no matter what, needs some sort of shooting stage in the middle. No matter what the genre, no matter what it's about, you need a shooting stage. So, so later we played games like Castlevania 4 on the SNES and okay, come on, wait, the shooting stage now. We can shoot the shooting stage. And See, have one. you gotta be into Have you played Looney Tunes for the Game Boy from Sunsoft? <laughs> that has a shooting stage. It has a, it has a shooting stage. You should play it. It's got uh, music from Manami Matsumae as yeah. well. Right, it's not bad. Right, but... Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, that was the kind of, uh, for European developers, they kind of had a knack for combining gameplay modes and making, like, the full experiences, you know, from one platform stage, one racing stage, one shooting stage. And generally, I think they didn't nail any of them. Uh, you know, most of those games, generally licensed games, would follow that. Um, but in the case of, for example, Turrican, you know, the shooting stages are actually quite good, and uh, yeah. that came from the fact that they had done R Type and Katakas yeah. and Denaris. So, you know, they could handle that. Because it's one of the few times where that merger works. Because generally, if you have a game that has action stages and shooter stages, the shooter stages tend to be very formulaic, where it's just kind of, you know, the same types of enemies. But now, you know, in the air for no reason. Oh, you know, you know, one that really that did it kind of in reverse and really well was um, uh, KO Yugekitai Katsugeki Hen for Saturn. Yes. Where it's because uh, the original KO Yugekitai was was pure shooter on Mega CD, and then the Saturn game is primarily a platform game, but they retained the shooter stages uh, for a couple parts of the game. And those are actually quite good. Should then yeah, have to see them again. The game you're talking about is Chaos Flying Squadron. Oh yeah, K that's right. was Chaos Flying Squadron. Was it was it just called Two? Yes. Because I think that yeah. did not get a. Yeah, that's right. It was Chaos Flying Squadron Two. That didn't get a U.S. release at all, which no. is a real shame. And yeah, both yeah, of them. Yeah. I'm just catching up on the chat while you find gentlemen talk. Uh, someone is saying they would love to see a Last Ninja collection or a remaster. Uh, it has been rumored for a long time, I know. There's also been rumors of Last Ninja 4 for the longest time. Uh, but uh, Last Ninja is another one we were talking about earlier in the stream. It really does need some sort of flashback compilation type thing too, because those games are very archaic and uh, a little bit hard for people to back into. So, you know... Yeah, very tried in that one. Yeah, so some sort of rewind feature, or maybe some updated controls, and uh, a full compilation of them. Because uh, Last Ninja 3 is incredible, in my opinion, but most people haven't played that. But man, the music in that game is incredible. And of course, Last Ninja 1 well, 2. Most people in this game is the long loading time, the loading screen. Then Oof. there is the meadow, then there's the park, the rocks appear, and now I can play one. 
Yeah, that's right. They had that uh, system where it built the scene uh, in game, which, like, Bleederboard Golf had the same, and the many others, of course, too. But uh, I always find, found that to be very artistically interesting. Uh, I always loved that as a kid to see, like, the scene built, uh, almost like a, a theater or something, like live theater, where they just roll in the, the sets. Just a bit of a, um, a look behind the curtains, how this thing actually works. Pretty much. But yeah, yeah last. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was also the NES version of Last Ninja by uh, Jalico, which is awful. So I want to have that on the collection. I do have a cartridge though. I didn't know so, that was one. Did that yeah. No, no, it came out in the US, believe it or not. Um, and uh, yeah, it's. Um, it's a conversion of last. It's called the Last Ninja, but it's a conversion of Last Ninja 2 for the NES. And uh, believe it or not, they ruined the music, which is like what? The like, yeah. thing, you know? Matt and it's like the Genesis Turrican. Yeah, pretty much. And uh, you know, the game themselves aren't. The game itself isn't that great either. Uh, but I was talking to Matt Gray, who's composer of Last Ninja 2, and because uh, I worked on a few projects with him, and I remember him saying that you know. He was pretty good with the NES. He did Micro Machines on the system and a couple other games. And he would have loved to have done it, but uh, this was contract work, most likely. He didn't have anything to do with that uh, version. So, so interesting to hear. I recall the Hoodspur that he did the last when he had the soundtrack of the Mega Drive for the Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's one, yes. Uh, he. <laughs> Right by, uh, I would love to see his live know. reaction to hearing that for the first time. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to imagine that. Uh, yeah, I, he really doesn't like when people bring up that version. Uh, when we were talking about Magnus earlier, and uh, that was US fans, and someone brought that copy of Turrican oh. to the mining, and they weren't aware that he hadn't done that conversion. So he, of course, signed it and was, you know, versus nice to everyone. But when the fan started talking to him, he mentioned it, like, you know, I didn't uh, do this one. And uh, it's not the best representation of Turrican music. And the fan was a little bit surprised by this because he loved the music in the Genesis Turrican game. So we were all I mean, just kind of... Do you know any others? Uh, definitely knew others as well. But for Turrican, this was the game he had brought. And, uh, so weird. Was, uh, so... I mean, it could have been worse. It could have brought the Universal Soldier. Oh boy! Didn't, you, you brought that last time, didn't you? I, I have a signed copy of Universal Soldier by Chris. <laughs> I forced it to sign it. So, I played. I played that at some point recently, and I was horrified yeah. by it. I mean, it is a straight-up conversion. Uh, and then the first boss, instead of being a robot, is Dolph Lundgren, just a giant Dolph Lundgren. I guess he is giant in real life. So. See, I always thought Dolph Lundgren would have worked really well in uh, China Warrior. No, as a boss? Yeah. For sure. Showdown Little Tokyo. Good old China Warrior. Power up. Someone's saying that's a little bit hard sometimes to hear. Uh, Thomas, due to the uh, game sound. Oh, oh the Sorry. game sound. I could turn on the game sound a little bit. Uh Unfortunately, I have the um, mic volume for you guys maxed out, so. Yeah, I'm shouting at the top of my lungs, so. I, I've been I through this before. I try to talk a bit louder now. I so, lose my uh, lecture voice. Exactly, the lecture voice. And you are, as we noted earlier, a real life teacher in video games. Yes, so, I actually what, am. What is the school that you teach at? It's called HDA, it's Hochschule Darmstadt, it's a German uh, university and the, uh, the course is called Animation and Game and uh, what I do there is game design, game history and lots of project coaching and uh, project work. And we went there, Audi, for uh, one of those demonstration yeah. days. I did us. That was yeah. awesome. And I think... Well, the uh... most awesome part I remember was uh, I, I showed you around the building and uh, in pretty much all of the, the work rooms, they had these really, really naughty drawings of minions doing unspeakable stuff. Oh, yeah. oh yes, the, the minions' drawings. Yes, that's right. That was something else. 
I remember, I, I think I can talk about this, uh, Thomas, but uh, uh, you told me that you had tried to start some sort of uh, course where you wanted me to show up as a guest to talk about terrible games. Because that's all yes, I can talk I about. I, I'm uh, still holding that course at the moment. Um, it's, yeah. uh, it's an uh, elective called Advanced Game Studies, and I was planning to have one <laughs> session about basically um, the art of a Kuzo game, about bad games Ooh. and uh, their appeal and all that, that stuff. But yeah, it didn't materialize uh, because nobody wants to take on that subject, so <laughs> we have you, to. Maybe we we'll try again and uh, get some people to sign up. If, if you want to fly into I Germany and hear me do a class on bad video games. Let Thomas know. Well, to tell you the truth, before we knew each other, I had one whole elective only about bad games. Ooh. I, I called that thing, maybe it was a bad idea, um, and this was about uh, critical failures, uh, commercial failures, and also hidden gems. And uh, what we did is every week uh, we spoke about one game that was for some reason considered bad, a flop or something like that. And of course, it turned out most of them really weren't because I, of course, I chose my games carefully. And um, <laughs> well, usually people came to the conclusion, okay, this isn't that bad after all. Maybe there is another problem with that. But I mean, the point why I did that, I think you can learn a lot from. Oh, absolutely. Perceivably bad games. Oh, I keep telling my wife. Oh, my wife to do that. I'm buying these games for educational purposes. Yes. <laughs> she just yeah. doesn't understand. You know, uh, sometimes let's plan something that's do some sort of a course on Phoenix games. Oh, I mean, I'm the teacher of that, so I I, I have might, the library. John, when he got to the the, the moldy face dog. Yeah, so the moldy John, face of course, dog, yeah. has to be a guest lecturer. Uh, though I think John would prefer to talk about good games. You know, so, I'm, I'm warming well, up we'll to talk. these b bad games a little bit, but I think Audie's the the, <laughs> ma the master of these. Although you discovered the. Audi discovered Crazy Golf, and then I turned around and discovered Zany Golf on the Mega Drive. That's right. There and is that Zany is, Golf. That is bad. Really bad. <laughs> yes. It was quite bad. <laughs> so, keep <laughs> going. But, you know, the thing is, I think if you talk about bad games, it's just a question how you do that. Because, uh, I mean, if you do that mean spirited and you're just angry about the bad games. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's not cool. Not fun at all, but it's not interesting. I think it's just, yeah. Oh, I have. Look, a... Why is it that? What happened there? And is there some charm to it? That's much more interesting because I don't. I think agree. I mean, I, I, have... I, I also collect bad movies for the same kind of reason. Is that the intent of these games is real? You know, there are there are ideas here. There's concepts here. There are someone believed in this project for the most part. There, I mean, there's mm, games Phoenix. like you know, Phoenix games where it's just you know, three K and the and the beer, but. You know, for me, there's a lot of kind of passion in the bad games rather than, you know, a lot of the newer games and stuff. There's a ton of passion, of course, in AAA games, but for me, they're a little bit too grand. So I have trouble kind of getting a full view of it. Whereas with these uh, older bad games, I can kind of wrap my head around, okay, this is what they were trying to do. Uh, I see. And then kind of, it teaches me a lot too. I mean, as a game producer. I yeah. also strive to make bad games. Uh, in fact, if for you eagle-eyed watchers, John's menu earlier on the Switch, there was a bad game there that I produced. That's right. Maybe uh, see, go on Twitter and tell me if you saw it. If you saw it, I'll send you a postcard. <laughs> um, well, what I like to call some of these things, it's a glorious failure. So they had high ambitions, they just failed, but they just went down guns blazing, it's still somehow cool. This is what I like. I like yeah, that much Those more types of fans. See, that's why I'm actually a fan of Daikatana. Yeah. I actually think it's not a not a terrible game. Daikatana is a great uh, story. And uh, I hope one day you get to detail that on the app. I would, I would love to get John Romero on there somehow to talk yeah. about it in a way that's not just like, boy, what a failure that was. No, no, because no. I think there's actually like interesting stuff going on in that game. It should be said that also whenever we do retro, we never do well, uh, except for Phoenix games. But we never do <laughs> it where it's like why and you know this is a failure. We always see it from hopefully a positive perspective. Yeah, even, exactly. That's uh, much more interesting. 
Uh, because some... I mean, there's so much, so much research and stuff on the internet already. We don't yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I, I, I like to live my life as positive as possible. I right. eat as I collect bad games. So, you know, I, I don't like having negative footage of anything when I do stuff. So, uh, funny. Yeah, yes. so cheers to that. Yeah. Uh, so, there was a super chat from Jonathan Hinson saying, Hello, gents from North Carolina. This soundtrack. Yeah, good uh, Good evening to you, in North Carolina. I love Absolutely. when I go there. My friends have some Bojangles. So. It is a great place. I would love to go again. I yeah, want to, yeah, I want to have some Bojangles right now. Yeah, Bojangles. The honey mustard flows like wine. <laughs> Someone's saying that Super Turrican is the weakest in the series, in his opinion. The world of long plays. Uh, I think they all have a wide experience. I don't know if any of them have the weakest experience because of that. Uh, I think uh, Super Turrican is very console. You know, this to me is very much like a bonafide console action game. Though. Super Turrican 1, like just playing more of this, I mean, it really does keep the exploratory feel of those original Amiga yeah. games in a way that Mega and Super Turrican 2 definitely do not, you know? It is it is the mid part between these two approaches. Yeah, exactly. It feels like somewhere in the middle, which is a really that, cool idea. That's what I like about it. Yeah. So, in a way, well, it's the last of the, the old school Turricans and already paving the way for what came afterwards. Uh, someone's asking me, do you play a AAA games, Audi? Uh, definitely. I mean, I try to keep up with as much as I can. And, uh, uh, of course, now that I work so much with John and visit him so much, you know, I gotten, uh, I definitely fell out of love with the video game industry during my uh, away time, so to speak. And uh, via John, I've been able to kind of reconnect and not just get an appreciation for the retro games again, but also modern games. Because yeah. I've started, you know, from John's kind of education and all this, just how these games fundamentally work on newer engines and new technology. It's fun for me to discover, you know, things that I didn't even think of before. So, I mean, DF is such an essential channel to enjoying video games today, I think. And I'm not just saying that because I collaborate so much. But I think DF has a huge place in the industry of making people understand, in layman's terms, how these games work. And, oh, congrats again. Yeah. And, but yeah, I think the Digital Foundry is the essential part of the industry. Well, there's always, you know... <clears throat> uh... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the first crash that happened today? No, so that happened before? that happened before as well, also in Super Terrican. So there's clearly some like weird little thing there that okay. but yeah. it hadn't happened before. So the game updated just before the stream started. Oh, so I'm wondering if it's something new from that. Um, could be. I mean it just released I also read from people who said that the, the the switch part is prone to crashing. Hmm. Okay, well. Uh uh, so far, look at I them. only really tried the the PS4 uh, version, so I I can't say. Oh wait, the credits hard to see. Wait, oh there we go. I see your name. Yes, my name should be in there. That's cool. Well, let, is it, let, let's look at some of the so. Okay, so yeah, we have the descriptions. These you wrote all the descriptions then for each of these games, kind of right here. Yeah. So as I mentioned at the very beginning, so for the people who missed it, so I actually uh, dug in the old development documents that Andreas Escher had, and I asked different members of Factor Five what's the actual stories, and then no one could really piece this all together. I mean, generally the manuals or the back of the boxes just kind of had a generic, you know hurricanes back and he's mm. saving the universe you know something like this so uh throughout everything i could find i pieced together the storylines of each game and then wrote these new uh descriptions and then the second paragraph uh describes the games themselves and what did introduce to the turrican series so these were a lot of fun to write actually and uh kind of get the lore of turrican all in one place so 
because uh, that wasn't the easiest. <laughs> Let's just say that. <laughs> well, I think you did more work on that law of terrorism than the creators back then, probably. Oh, because they... I had a feeling... <laughs> yeah. Every new game, okay, the machine is coming back, and oh, by the way, there is an enemy called the machine from Terrorism 2 on. I yeah. Think part one had a lot of uh, nice law, actually. Yeah, I mean, the first game actually differs. I mean, it has kind of like this AI and Morgul and... Um, yeah. Pretty you know, cool. it's a uh, somewhat different introduction to the series, and then two comes in with the machine, all this stuff. Yeah. The the interesting thing, yeah, yeah, weren't they trying to do like a make it a licensed Pink Floyd game, and it just kind of fell through? So, <laughs> no. uh, um, but yeah, so uh, Pink Floyd got me off my track. Uh, they'll do that. <laughs> yeah, they'll do that. Uh, no, but, uh, oh yeah, Super Turrican is the one that was kind of interesting because Super Turrican is kind of like a compilation and a uh, best of in the yeah, sense. Yeah, and it brings back a lot oh, of the yeah. bosses in new ways. and Right, so no one really... I like how the fist is turning in the beginning, for example. That's a nice effect. Or how it, oh, zo yeah. it zooms in. Like, you use Mode 7. Cause it's like, oh, here's the Amiga boss and it's small and then it, like, scales up and it's huge. Yeah. You're like, oh, this is Super stuff. NES. The interesting part, though, was that I was playing when I was playtesting. I finished Super Turrican, and because uh, I, as I wrote these synopses, I just played through to see if I could come up with some, you know, mumbo jumbo to make it sound more grand. And Super Turrican, the machine doesn't appear. He's not the boss. So the bad guy in the game and in the cutscene does not actually appear in the game, because yeah. they, you know, they developed the game first. He was not one of the bosses they included. So, eh. So that I mean, was... there's, of course, a story about that and having to cut down the game because of memory constraints. That's true, yeah. I don't think the machine was in the direct cut either, though. No, it wasn't. No. Oh, so, yeah. This was just an after... The, the, I, I, think the, I think Julian was the one who told me in the end that like the cutscenes were just something later on, just kind of tied all together, and the machine was the bad guy. So <laughs> uh, that was kind of funny. Uh, someone asked me a question. For some reason, I'm getting questions. Uh, Audi, was your role on the team the backstories for each game, or was there more work? Oh, uh, so I was producer on this whole thing. Uh, so I play tested extensively. I made some decisions in game, uh, and then most importantly, I was the designer of the collector edition, and then some of the items that me and John are working on as yep. well as the uh, design on the retro versions of the cartridges and uh, many things. So I was very honored by Strictly Limited inviting me to do so. Let's see. I'm just catching up on the chat while you guys play. This boss is very much straight out of Darius. Yeah, that's the Darius boss if I ever saw one. And yes, I confirmed that <laughs> that was definitely and what they were thinking so <laughs> yeah i think this is one one important factor about all these games that the makers back then were just huge fans of the of all these arcade games back then of yeah this whole arcade scene of these shooters especially yeah. i mean yeah. archetype and I mean, these were the golden days for these games yeah well, what i also really like i must say is um we, we mentioned the tarikan 2 introduction uh, a few minutes ago yeah you can also just see how anime was just slowly seeping into germany mm -hmm. and um these artists seeing this for the first time thinking this is cool, we want something like that ourselves. Frank. Yeah, Frank and Lutz were hugely into Japanese animation and comics and video games. So, I mean, the more they come in with like Mega Turrican, the more Japanese influence you get. And I think Julian yeah. is. Well. Uh, we haven't talked much about Julian because we want to save a lot of his information to the documentary. Yeah. I mean, he was. Uh, at the time, you know, these were young guys trying to figure out the video industry at a young age, and that's not easy. It's not easy even today. No. And uh, Julian, you know, deserves a lot of respect for the fact that he managed to take these guys under his wing at a young age himself and then kind of make a team out of this and then create history, you know. So uh, all the props to him for this. Absolutely. He was yeah. also quite a famous guy in Germany in the, in the, the gaming scene. Yeah. Because apart from making games, he also wrote about games. He was an, an, uh, an, uh, an author for a game, a magazine called Video Games back in these days. Right. And he uh, wrote a lot of uh, action game reviews back then. And you could right. always see he's coming at it from a program, from a developer's perspective. 
he, I mean, Julian was someone that could kind of you know, put his finger on the pulse and kind of recognize what was next. And, uh, I mean, this is why he managed to get Factor Five so far into the U.S. working with Lucas. Yeah, right. that's just amazing to think about. So, I mean, this is... I don't think you can even do this so much today the way he did it. No. I mean, the world is different, but, I mean, this is 1995. And, I mean, these guys, still so young and straight up to San Francisco. And then uh, not soon after, you know, work on Star Wars and become the premier Star Wars. Uh, yeah, that, that is an amazing thing all today. Yeah. yeah absolutely and Some then to think, think that they not only would they go to work on star wars but they would then become a like one the premier launch title for nintendo's gamecube yes i recall yeah. buying that even today oh same uh there was a super chat uh well played the df for doing this truly uh, turry deserves uh so much more eyes on it than that it didn't get outside of the eu all Ooh, cross for happy future i, mean, I like uh, that, that i like that nickname turry for turrican yes turry I, yeah. i've never heard that before but that's good was there uh, was there a nickname for turrican in germany back in the day no there wasn't okay it was just turrican. i think it was just just short and uh and cool enough to why well, would, well, would you want to change it yeah that's right I mean, it rolls off the tongue. I mean, you know, maybe for for the UK, Turrican's a little bit long, but you know, if you're German, that that's like a that may as well be like a vowel. It's so short compared to German words. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> I like this effect, by the way. The water, the water splashes in Turrican one. How they kind of like draw a, multiple sprites to show, yeah, uh, the splash kind of trail up behind you. That's neat. And yeah, it's, it's small touches that you know most other developers wouldn't even think of. Yeah, this this is still pretty cool looking, even now. Wow, the Turrican One is just massive, though, isn't it? This like world that they made—it's yeah. so crazy. It's really interesting. I mean, well, me about that. Sorry. no, I was just gonna say. Please I mean, I could do it, and that uh, that was a big. Thing with this hardware when it came out was that you could make these sprawling huge levels that uh, even the consoles at the time couldn't do no absolutely i don't think this would have been feasible quite like this on an nes necessarily no not in this way at least no you know for the um for the article in m games i wrote i um i also had an interview with uh, people like audi for example but also lutz osterkorn and uh dennis from uh from the publisher in him and uh, I asked Lutz about um, the change in level design between the older Turricans and the newer ones, and uh, why they it became more linear. His first answer was, yeah, we were just too lazy to make this thousand streams, only one per trend was at mass. <laughs> yes. Uh, I like that answer quite a lot. He, he, Lutz is a very funny guy, and so much, yes. uh, so many stories, so much information. So oh, I was really happy there. that you got him. And uh, yeah, thank you for interviewing me for M Games. I think I've been there quite oh, a few times few months so uh i should be getting some residuals soon no oh. <laughs> that's always good so someone's saying that there was a comic in an amstram magazine that gave him the nickname mr t i see okay uh i will have to look into this uh, an amstram magazine so was it in english or in french uh if you can give us some more information i might track this all down and uh who knows i would like to see some like uh, art done you know in this where it's like turrican and mr t together somehow <laughs> yeah mr t underneath dark <laughs> with the gold chains oh my gosh yeah it's like <laughs> we can only dream oh man i mean well, in a way i would say turrican is a sort of a big crossover game already because um i mean yeah. the game is pretty much equal part of of mario there's metroid there's contra in there yeah. Just taking bits and pieces of all of them and making something new out of it. Yeah, it's interesting how you look at, for example, Hard and Heavy, where you kind of see a few things already pop up by then, uh, which, you know, of course, started its life as John's Sisters 2, uh, but then became Hard and Heavy with these robots. And then that has a very heavy Metroid influence. <laughs> and a hard influence, I hope. And a hard influence. And then... Uh, 
Yeah, and then you get the Turk and finally, and it all comes together. I mean, you can also see yeah. like Akis, uh and things like this. So uh, it is basically Factor 5's experience rolled into one game, and that's why it's so good. Man, this is pretty yeah, nice. I agree. Ooh, there we go. Amstrad Action Magazine, published by Future Publishing. Mm -hmm. uh, Amstrad sure. Action Magazine. I have not read that. I was not into the Amstrad. Uh, so, I do know that there was a Jim Power on Amstrad, because uh, I played that. So, How is that version? I think we looked that up, right? It's like, yeah, uh, it's not very good. It's No, it's not, not on par with the originals. No. I think the best version of Jim Power, though, is the uh, cancelled Mega Drive version. Yes, uh, incredible music by Chris there, and uh, basically the best version of the game in terms of its difficulty and balance. Yeah, exactly. It's much more balanced and playable, because the other versions, especially like the Amiga and the PC Engine version, are so brutally difficult. Yeah. And kind of stiff as well. Yes. Uh, someone's uh, World of Long Plays was mentioning that Psycho Nix uh, Oscar is a huge influence on Turk, and absolutely. Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were playing that all the time. And uh, we, when I was doing a web show with Chris back in almost 11 years ago now, but back in the day, me and Chris used to do live streaming of his games. And one of the games that we played uh, eventually was uh, Oscar because that was such a big influence on them. And very recently, uh, I was watching a live stream with uh, M2, the developer in Japan. Oh, where yeah. Where they announced that they were doing a Data East collection of their earlier uh, arcade titles, including Psychonix Oscar. That's cool. And Hori-san actually cool. mentioned that, you know, Psychonix Oscar is a huge influence on Turk. And I was very impressed by the fact that he knew that. <laughs> so uh hoodie is definitely a huge turrican fan so yeah i was surprised back a few months ago when you uh, when when the, the first trailer of the collection was shown the first announcement that's right suddenly i was the thing and oh there's cory what's he doing here no, he's, <laughs> that's he's right. fan. Uh, oh that yeah. trailer that's right that yeah, we, that's, we put together uh, when you were here that one time that was cool yeah john yeah. did a great job editing that and uh the unsung hero was uh rudy stemba who uh, yes. did some music for that and a uh, great guy. Yeah, because uh, I didn't have any music or anything to go with it. And like uh, he actually worked with me to get like a properly timed clip that just fit right in. Yeah. And I mean, Rudy, amazing. amazing musician in his own right. Oh, yeah. Rudy's so, awesome. Rudy is an awesome guy. I'm so happy to finally meet him for the documentary interview yep. stuff. He has and a lot of good stories. Great. And he has uh, really good stories. And, uh, of course, Rudy will be forever remembered in the fact that uh, his car appeared in Rogue Squadron as an unlockable ship. Oh, so, <laughs> that car. was his uh, car. Oh, my goodness. But uh, we learned a lot from his interview, actually. And especially his uh, lineage with Star Wars was incredible. And I don't think that story has been told. So hopefully some way, somehow we can get uh, Rudy's story regarding like Mr. Nuts and Star Wars and these other great games he did into DF Retro over time. That's right. Also, uh, for that trailer that we did, most of it was filmed off my CRT, and then I got That's stuff right. from... I captured stuff from the 16-bit consoles, but World of Long Plays helped with the... Uh, he for something else as well but he actually helped get the Turk in two footage so I was able to put some of like the shooter stuff in that trailer oh, thanks right. to thanks to yeah, his yeah. footage so, and he's of course here with us now so uh, that's awesome yeah thanks to you I, th this project was really cool for me because I've been in this community for many many years with Chris and I met a lot of the fans you know I met a lot of these names uh, in the actual person and when we started this uh, you know, I had had my hiatus from the industry and then, you know, I've come back the last couple of years and then working on this and being able to bring everyone back together uh, was really uh, quite emotional. I get very emotional easily these days, but 
it was quite fun to not only be working with John and then doing, you know, trailer, documentary, all these fantastic new things, but going back to all these people I had met over these, you know, 10, 15 years and being like, do you want to take part in this, you know, historic collection? And everyone uh, joining was uh, really cool. Uh, someone's asking me more questions. Uh, unusual, many questions for me here. Uh, Audio, you said you worked together with Chris. Were you involved with game development in the 90s too? No, my first game development was in 2002. Uh, I was an intern for Funcom at that time. It was the oh, very first right, time. Yeah. And you went and asked uh, them about all their 16 bit and Mega CD yes, games. And they were uh, just like, up. who are you? <laughs> yeah, I, like, I went up to their glass display of Sega CD and Super Nintendo games. I was like, can I play these games? And they're like, uh, why would you want to play these old games? Like, why would, why would I want to play your new games? <laughs> they, they were not happy with me from day one. So, uh, yes. But I started game development officially in 2002. And uh, primarily in video game music in the beginning. Uh, if you want to know more about me for some reason, you can go to Retro RGB. I did a two-hour interview with him. Oh, that's regarding an epic interview. Yeah. Uh, been having a lot of good feedback for it so i was very scared that people would just say don't do this again but uh, uh people were very nice so go to retro rgb if you want to know more about my uh, background absolutely but i think guys uh it's getting on a bit here we've been at this for a while so maybe it's time we start to wrap things up what do you say no problem sure. so maybe I, I can tell one more story if yeah, please about absolutely playing uh, Megatarik enough. So my first uh, encounter with Julian Engelbrecht was uh, back before um, Tarikin 3 and this one were released and um, he was writing for video games back then and in their magazine they had their number, uh, their telephone number and for some reason just me and a friend decided okay let's call these guys, maybe we get Julian Engelbrecht on the phone and to ask him what's happening with Tarikin uh, 3 because we were uh, waiting for it. So we called that number and really we got uh, Julian on the line <laughs> so we asked, okay, uh, can we ask what, what's going on in Tarikin 3? Can you tell us something about it? And he told us about that swinging rope. So we didn't know that before. That was pretty cool. <laughs> That's how we got the information back in the day. I love it. There we go. I turned on the evil yeah, I light. Think... <laughs> I think maybe calling a company today tell us something about the new game wouldn't work out as well. That wouldn't work too well, no. Yeah, I miss these days. And now I've switched to night mode with the evil red light. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I feel like the Doom Guy portrait now. Yes. <laughs> oh man. So gentlemen, that was a lot of fun. I'm glad we got Chris on here at the beginning. I'm glad Thomas could have come in at the end. And I'm so glad that Audie you. helped set everything up because uh this was awesome oh anytime and yeah we got we'll get you back on as well again thomas it's always nice to have you here an actual professor of course <laughs> so well um, not professor it's a professor is a different title in germany oh sorry <laughs> <laughs> that's true stuff. you're not yet to the uh, level of uh, doctor doctor professor working on it someday all right well Thanks again to the full audience for joining us uh, throughout this, how long has it been? Two and a half hour stream. So yeah. we've had some fun. We've heard some interesting tidbits here and there. And um, you saw me be terrible at Turrican. Uh, I could actually play them a little bit better than this under normal circumstances. But as always, it's uh, it's always impressive to see people playing games and stream like this because it's way more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so uh but anyway that's all for today uh i'll be back again tomorrow with another stream with uh hopefully with uh cory carlson and tim rogers we'll be playing some wild arms five so be sure to tune in for that and then after that i'm sure uh, audie and i will be back with more uh fun things to stream i think we have some stuff in the works like potentially some nes uh or famicom pirate stuff I think you wanted to do more, more, or more of the homebrew stuff. Well, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to review everything, but we have some cool stuff on the way. So, yeah, uh, we'll be back with more streams, and we have some other cool stuff in the works for DF, making some changes. 
uh, be varying up content. And we'll also try to get some streams in covering the modern stuff. So if I can just convince Alex and Richard and everybody to join me as well. Because I'm sure some people would like to see that. So, yeah. If you guys enjoyed this... You need, you what's need that? to stream some East 9. East 9 is so, so good. I have a copy on the way. So I'm excited to play some Ease yeah, 9. Very good for you. I hope you'll like it as much as I do. So, all right, guys. Take care.